executive director here. Um, I see some familiar faces in the audience, but I also see a few people that I don't think I've met before. So um, show of hands, how many people are here for the very first time? Oh my gosh, wait, I wish I had my cell phone. That would be amazing. Yes, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, one more time. Oh. My board is gonna be so happy. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, for all of you who are here for the first time, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do here. Um, the Center for Book Arts promotes active explorations of the artistic practices related to the book as an art object. Um, we are doing that in so many ways, through exhibitions, as you may have seen earlier, um, through workshops where we're teaching people how to physically make books, book binding, sequencing, printing, design. Also through literary presentations, we have an unbelievable lineup of literary presentations coming up this spring. I definitely encourage you to come back for those. Um, we also have artist residencies and we have programs just like what we're doing tonight. Um, this year at the center, we are focused on language as a cultural bridge. How language within art can create, express, and document ideas. Last spring, when um, we were deciding what this year's History of Art series would be all about, um, we were talking about how we could reach outside of New York City, how we could reach outside of the Western canon, and at the same time, how we could create a platform for discussing and documenting ideas around design for the next generation. Tonight, we are live streaming this program in order to transcend borders. We've already heard from people outside of New York, um, although many people in New York as well, um, that are logging on in Belgium, Iran, California, and Mexico to watch tonight's program. Additionally, we are going to be archiving this program and the future programs in this series on our website so that we can transcend borders um, and people across various geographic locations and time can revisit this series. <clears throat> Tonight, this coming Saturday and next Thursday, is all about gaining perspective and widening scope, historicizing and learning through the intersection of Arabic and English. What are the limits of language and what can we learn from the space where languages come together? Tonight's speakers will be talking about technology, branding, and how current practices relate to the heritage of Arabic letter forms. But before I introduce our host, I want to stress that our work here is not over after this series. At the center, we are going to, we are aiming to continue supporting this dialogue through multilingual exhibitions, by publishing texts in various languages, 
and continuing to open more space to artists working across different languages and media. I also want to take a moment to thank our members and supporters. Um, this series is supported in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislator, also by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. So, to the main event now. <laughs> um, our host tonight, and, and the person who really deserves all the credit for um, gathering this amazing group of people tonight, Saturday, and next week, is Dr. Nadine Shaheen. She is an award-winning Lebanese type designer and principal at Arabic Type Limited. She has a master's in typeface design from the University of Reading, UK, and a PhD from Leiden University in the Netherlands. She has numerous awards, including two awards of excellence from the Type Directors Club in New York. She, um, the typefaces, the list of typefaces that she has designed is incredibly impressive. And to name just a few, um, uh, Universe Next Arabic, which is, I mean, <laughs> Palatino Arabic, um, uh, New Helvetica Arabic. <laughs> I mean, like, the, the big ones. Um, so she's really a little bit of a, a typography celebrity. Um, Nadine's work has also been featured in Meg's History of Graphic Design and First Choice, which hi highlights the, uh, the work of the 250 top global designers. She was selected as one of Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business. And in 2017, she was selected as one of Creative Review's Top 50 Creative Leaders. Everyone, welcome. Dr. Medin Shaheen. Um, thank you, Corinna, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you everyone who is watching live and who will be watching later, and particularly to the people in the audience you've uh, given up a free evening for us and you've braved uh, the coronavirus so good job <laughs> so uh, yeah um yeah so thank you so much for the center for book arts for for this invitation to to bring us all together here and for promoting this dialogue um the uh, the themes of arabic type design and arabic typography are ones that at least for me are absolutely fascinating and we still do not have enough books we still do not have enough lectures and presentations about the topic no matter how much we do it's still such a young field and we need to do more and events like these are absolutely important for bringing us together to speak about this to hear your feedback hear your questions and also share with you what we've been doing so the the themes that we have over the panel and i don't know if you guys are aware that we will have today but also on saturday and then thursday march 19 uh, and also a small event also on march 20, 21 so and we'll be talking about that later as well but but the theme was that we try to look at the concepts of modernity this is what we're focusing on today uh, we will be looking at uh, contemporary arabic graphic design on saturday and we'll be looking at technology and heritage uh, on the 20 uh, on the 19th so, uh, so we're really trying to look at the concepts of type, typography, and graphic design uh, related to the Arabic script from very different threads. And, and today we're focusing on the question of modernity. Uh, for myself, the, the reason why I, I'm interested in this topic is that um, we sometimes have the view that Arabic is very classical and the region is very traditional. So the concept of modernity comes with its own loaded ideological, political, cultural questions as well, which I think are very interesting to unpack, which we will try to do here from type design uh, perspective. Um, but uh, I'm not here alone to speak with you. Uh, I also have two amazing panelists who will be with me. I, uh, so we will have Wael Moros and Thomas Jokin. Uh, I will introduce them when it's time for them when it's their turn to speak. Um, I will start first. It's my prerogative as the curator for this that I decided to give myself the first spot and also more time than everybody else. So, uh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah, I'm exercising my prerogative. So, um, yeah, so I, I will be talking to you a little bit about uh, the theme, basically, modernity. And uh, I, um, when it comes to the question of modernity, I thought we start the usual boring way with a, with a definition. Um, and what is what is modernity? Uh, so it is the self-definition of a generation about its te own technological innovation, governance, and social socio socioeconomics. Uh, what does it actually mean? 
Um, I will get through some examples of some words and adjectives that for myself define uh, what modernity in design in general uh, means to us today. Uh, we might have different views of what these adjectives are. We could understand our design trends in this day uh, a little bit differently, but these these are extremely, extremely general generalizations. So if if you think, oh yes, but there is something else that is trendy that doesn't fit this, just uh, step a little bit back and zoom out and let's look at the whole global design trend and also not just today or yesterday but rather like the whole decade or two decades or even three decades um, so and, and I don't want to start in type design uh, I would like to start with um, some general examples first so within the like generalizations and examples that I'm thinking of like what is modernity where do we see it where is this aesthetic coming from uh, we have industrializations. We have design trends that are generally simple. Designs are generally slick. Just think of all the rebrands that are happening uh, in the last, you know, few years. But even from a longer uh, point of view, so contemporary design is quite slick in aesthetic. Uh, and and like you can also look at this. This will be one of my one of my examples. Just look at this kind of aesthetic, like the yeah, the laptop. Um, Contemporary design is also a little bit practical. Uh, the way we look at design is very much design that is produced on mass scale. So it's not something which is not like what you have here done by hand, uh, but is more industrial in that sense. And in general, is non-decorative. And this is where you might start to think, oh, but we actually have a lot of lettering and it is quite decorative. Yes, but that is still not the mass scale, not the 80, 90% of what we see in terms of design today. And then we have uh, one step of extrapolation of that, of everything that we see today, is that when you look at the design products that we deal with, it doesn't feel like a human made them. One reason is because a machine made them. Most of what we use on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis has been produced by a machine. And that brings its own aesthetics. And just to show you just a little bit of how much we need to zoom out to be able to think of modernity, I, I would like to just give some examples of how aesthetics have been changing. So obviously this is the latest version of the iPhone. You can see here the laptop, Apple products. Just think of those. They are trendsetters, so they're quite a good example of contemporary design aesthetic. And then think of this. Yeah, so like, like you feel the difference, right? The la when I say non-decorative, I am looking at this kind of decoration and the fact that it doesn't exist in products today, only as an exception, but not as a mainstream kind of product. The other thing is looking at architecture. So other than industrial design, let's look at architecture. And you have not necessarily this kind of aesthetic, but this is something that feels like, yeah, this has been designed in our age, in our time frame. And then think of something that looks like this. Yeah. So when I talk about the simplicity of form, the design is slick today, that we, we see the app or we lack the human touch, uh, this, this is where you really feel it. No? Because this you can imagine that someone was working there and you know, literally sculpting those decorations. And then with this kind of, app, this is gorgeous, I'm not saying it's not, but it doesn't have that kind of attention to um, decorative detail that we see in the other. Um, and, and there's a point to why I'm showing you all of these. And then my last example is this. Um, I, I don't have a contemporary comparison to it. We can all look in the mirror and see what we're wearing today. But just to just to also pinpoint that this is not them dressing as uh, you know um, big occasions. The one like I'm just going to read the caption. Victorian fashion plate left is an early 1880s day wear dress. This is what you used to wear during the day. Yeah. So imagine what we wear, you know, like yoga pants and a t-shirt, and then imagine this. The center is an 1880s evening dress, right is a mid-1880s day dress. So this is what women were wearing to, like, have lunch. So again, what we wear is very different from what women were wearing, you know, in the 1880s. Not to say that ours is better or ours is less, it's just we live in a very different content aesthetic. Yeah. So the reason why I'm pointing this out is that there is a trend in type design today, which is the sans serif, when we think of Latin, it's a geometric sans serif if we think of the last few years as well. But what I'm trying to say is that that aesthetic is not coming from the Latin script. That aesthetic is coming from all of these aesthetics. Yeah. That general 
uh, design sense and aesthetic that we live in today, where things are relatively more simple, yet not so decorative, not so many layers. Um, and that translates into typography. Typography, at the end of the day, is part of visual culture's uh, expression. It's part of our communication. It needs to fit with everything else that we do, right? It is the voice of how we communicate, but it needs to fit with the products it is trying to sit next to. It needs to fit with the overall general aesthetic and the way of life that we live. And this is where that trend is coming. The reason I'm saying is all of this is that there will be voices who will say that when it comes to Arabic type design, we need to design Arabic typefaces that look like the manuscripts that used to be written 200 years ago. But what I am saying is, because there is no sans serif trend in Arabic, and we, there is no sans serif in Arabic because that is a Latin term doesn't fit in Arabic, but uh, there is a lot to be understood in terms of where is this aesthetic coming from, and if the current aesthetic in type design is for that simplicity because it is reflecting an overall aesthetic within the entire world that we live in that is coming into simplicity, then how does that translate itself into Arabic? Do we, do, are we part of that general aesthetic or not? So these are some questions that we need to think about. There is not one answer. Every type designer will have a different answer to these things. Uh, and, and I think it's more important that we ask the questions than how we answer them. The more interesting the question, the more interesting the the, the answer, obviously, but we don't have to even agree on the answers, but we need to agree that these are important questions that we need to think about. So, uh, so the focus of the presentation today, I need to keep checking the time because I always speak too much. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so I will be talking about myths in, in Arabic type design, and I will sort of try to like bust them out. <coughs> so, uh, the first one, and this is myth number zero. Normally you start counting at one, but this is an underlying myth that sort of drives a lot of the other ones. So I thought that we need to give it a number zero because this is really like ground zero for these things. So, um, and that is sort of like the point of view that there is no evolution anymore in Arabic calligraphy. That Arabic calligraphy looks like this. So what you see over here mostly is Nasr calligraphy uh, from Ottoman period and then a little bit of Sulus, gorgeous. There's no debate on that. This is part of our legacy. We love it. There is no, no debate about that. But there will be uh, views on the, on the question of Arabic typography, how it is influenced by these manuscripts. And we need to think, is this aesthetic the aesthetic that we live with today? Uh, is this the only aesthetic that we live with today? Obviously not. We accept this, but there is more. Um, but there is also the question of calligraphy, and, and for many, they will, um, there is that understanding that Arabic calligraphy evolved and continued to evolve and was perfected by the Ottoman calligraphers, examples that you can see over here, but that this is the golden age of Arabic calligraphy, and then it's stuck there, and then it doesn't move anymore, but, but that is false. And uh, one example, and here I show you the work of my uh, teacher uh, and my mentor, Samir Sayer, uh, he taught me Arabic typography at the American University of Beirut. And my entire understanding of the modernity in Arabic script, whether it is in calligraphy or in typography, was born because of his lecturing, because of his course, and because of his vision of Arabic calligraphy. And this is some of this work. This is the word Allah. When you look at this, this is a very different aesthetic from what we've seen before. We see the, the simplicity here. We see boldness. We see a different aesthetic from what we've seen before. Is it Arabic? Yes, of course. Is it gorgeous? Yes, also, obviously. So, I mean, I dare you to say no. <laughs> this, is, this is brilliant. He's, he's an amazing uh, calligrapher. But, um, and then we see, you know, um, um, contrast. We see tension. We see a, a playfulness of form. Uh, these are obviously both in the Kufi style. Uh, this is more free form, uh, his personal style of, uh, of calligraphy. This is his own. He invented this. This is not the canon of Ottoman six scripts, al aklam al sitta that we inherited from the Ottomans. This is his work. And it is an evolution in Arabic calligraphy. This is a new style. There is another uh, calligrapher uh, currently lives in Dubai, Wissam Shokat. He also has his own style of calligraphy. Recently, like you should check him out on Twitter. He's been giving examples of how he how he writes the system for his own, he said, calls it khat with some, so with some script. Um, that is a new style of calligraphy. So there is more uh, to be done in Arabic calligraphy than those, you know, like six plans that were perfected by the, by the Ottomans. And so when we think of the Arabic script, we should not think, even in calligraphy, we should not think of a static uh, criteria of this is what the Arabic script looks like, and that's the end of it. No, 
We have some styles that were perfected, but we have the choice and we have the ability to continue to evolve and to continue to invent new calligraphic styles like what we see over here. Uh, the work of Samir Sire has also recently expanded to non-letter forms that look like letter forms, uh, massive scale. So this will be this is smaller than the actual size and much much bigger with like massive scale and fast movements, but still working with the inspiration of Arabic letter forms to go even beyond what the letters themselves are. So this is a view of Arabic calligraphy that goes beyond even the letter forms and, and the, the purpose of the, the written piece becomes something different. Uh, and again this brings an aesthetic which is very different from what we've seen over here. And the point is not that it has to be this or it has to be this. No, the point is that there's a lot of possibilities for what Arabic can look like and we need to be open to them. It doesn't mean that we do shit stuff and we say, oh yeah, but I invented something new. No, obviously not. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I also, like, I'm gonna try not to say the effort because like, we're recording this, but I am very bad mannered, so I apologize in advance. Anyways, so but we're not even discussing politics. When I do politics conversations, I it gets worse. So <laughs> I apologize in advance. Anyway, so myth number one. Now we start uh, with the with the counting. So there are no vertical alignments in Arabic. No, this is false. This is absolutely false. And I'm not gonna give an example of my own typefaces. I would like to give examples of Ottoman calligraphy. So when we think of Latin typefaces, when we think of vertical alignments and vertical measures, we think of a baseline, we think of X height, we think of ascender, we think of cap height, we think of descenders. Normally these are the metrics when we talk about Latin. And then when we talk about Arabic, we don't have those same things. We can talk about the baseline as like the line through on which we're writing. We do have ascenders, we do have descenders, there is no X height. Uh, so there is, you know, more complexity in that shape. Uh, but this is graphical analysis that I did as part of my PhD, where I was saying that basically what we do have in Arabic, yes, we have a system of alignment. It's based on what you see over here uh, on the right, uh, the rhombic dot. And this is how you start measuring. And in different calligraphic styles, the height of the ascender depends on how many rhombic dots you have. So it's not always the same. So that is the first one. The second one is that we don't really have a baseline which is straight, we have a base ribbon. So when we're writing in Arabic, Arabic is partially connected, right? So we're writing with a you know continuous movement and then we stop and then we start again, sometimes in the middle of a word, sometimes at the beginning of a word, depends on the letter forms. But basically we have this base ribbon that keeps going and we go above and below that base ribbon based on the rhombic dots. This is what this is showing. It looks a little bit like the uh, musical notes uh, but what you see over here is that it's not even straight, it's not even the same, like every line is a little bit different, but what you do have is this um, sort of internal system of proportion where the characters go, for example, two dots above this base ribbon, or two dots below, or one dot above, or five dots above. So there is a system of alignment in Arabic. We cannot say that there isn't, like when we're zooming in, you can see over here, like, I'm going to, uh, okay, now I have to take this away. Okay, so yeah, okay, now we're free. So, uh, like for example, the ra is two dots below, the nun is two dots below, the dal is three dots above, uh, the elif is like four dots above the base, so it's a five in total, the meme is one dot below, the ra again is two dots. So we have like they go up and down, you know. Obviously, this is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So don't panic. I'm speaking Arabic. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see you as you never know. So, um, anyways, and then like the meme is one dot above, and and so you have this system of alignment. It's a bit like a little bit of waves, and um, but yeah. So we we do have that system of alignment. It's just much more complex. In other styles, like for example in Kufi, we still have it. Uh, it's just it's a little bit more simplified. So this is again a little bit of you know trying to show you very poorly. Just zoom in on on what it looks like. Um, but other than the vertical alignments, we also have this internal system of proportions. Um, this was designed by, not designed, but like devised by a calligrapher called Ibn Mukla a very long time ago. Uh, where again, the, the, the measures, and you see here the Aleph is six rhombic dots. So the measures of the characters are based on the rhombic dots. Uh, this typeface is Palatino Arabic. And um, I had designed this with uh, Professor Hamanzat. Uh, as a companion to Palatino, and I had not thought to check if the typeface fits the rhombic dot system. Uh, and I thought we had finished, and then I, and then I was thinking like, maybe I should try and check. Then I checked it, and it didn't fit. I was like, okay, what if I changed my proportions to fit to the rhombic dot system that Ibn Mukla has devised? 
uh, and I made the adjustments, and suddenly the typeface looked much better. So even though you could design something that is possible, when you speak, if you're designing a classical calligraphy, uh, classical typeface based on calligraphic proportions, if you follow those proportions, it will look much more elegant and much nicer. So yeah, we do not have necessarily the exact same one-to-one -one system, but we cannot say we don't have vertical alignments, and we do have the system that we have inherited, depending on each calligraphic style, obviously. So myth number two. Arabic is free form. I have to apologize. The word free form is not, I, I couldn't come up with the right one. Um, sometimes you hear conversations like, yeah, but like Arabic is, you know, it's not modular, or I, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, that it's, it's basically free. You can do whatever you like because it's also round and organic and all of that. But, but that is not the case, as I've just said. We do have a relationship of elements. We do have the rhombic dot system. And we do have like a very sophisticated sense of what elements relate to one another. So this is, again, examples from, from my PhD, the uh, just graphical analysis of, of, of the NAS script. Uh, the white bits are the ones that are repeating. So uh, you can see like the, the tooth. Uh, in the J and the scene is the same, so top line, and then the head of the wall repeats in the cuff and the three, and then the bottom of the wall and the left. So I should just, I'm just gonna hold this for the while. So, like, these bits are uh, related to one another, these are almost the same, but not really. This one usually is a little bit longer. These are practically always the same. Uh, this ending of the B is repeated, the B repeated in the fe and the calf. And then the cup of the moon is repeated in the scene, the sad and the lamb. And then again, the sad is repeated in the ta. Uh, descenders of the jim and the ayn, the same dal related to the calf, ayn related to the hamza, and descender of the calf and the ya are related to one another. So we do have a system of relationship. It's not free form. It's not like, you know, free for all, kind of like draw whatever you like just because it looks organic. No, we have a system of relationships that we need to follow. And normally, they will follow together the same across scripts. So normally, most of the times, these relationships hold in Kufi as well, not just in Nas. So in the other calligraphic style that we can have. Um, did I not do this? Ah, these ones are uh, a little bit different. <laughs> ah, here we're looking at what types of descenders we can have. Here we're looking at the kind of wave that where some characters are very similar to one another. So you see some kind of repetition, and we have four forms per character. Here we have a character where there is nothing that is repeating, really, uh, from one to the next. This is the ha, and this is the he. And don't panic if you can't say ha, it's OK. Um, ha is like habibi, which is like beloved. Um, yeah, teaching people stuff. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, if that's the only thing you learn of today, you go out and you say habibi to everyone, that's perfectly fine. So a bit of love never goes bad. Um, yeah, myth number three, Arabic is not geometric. I recently heard this on a call and I was pissed off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I was consulting, I was like, no, we can't say that. So no, Arabic is geometric. So uh, this is one example, this is from Iran, an example of Arabic on, on, on ceramics. And you can see here, this is like practically a circle. This is part of a circle, this is another part of a circle. This is not so much a circle, but like there is geometry in this style. Uh, there is geometry even more in this style, like this one also from Iran. If you are drawing it vertical, like on a horizontal base line, this is properly geometric. So we do have a kind of ornamental kufi, which is basically drawn with a compass and a pen and a pencil and, and a ruler. So, um, so yeah, we do have examples for that. We do have examples for something even more <laughs> complex uh, and simplified at the same time with a square kufi. Again, this is from Iran. Uh, gorgeous. Uh, application on ceramics, on tiles, not ceramics. Uh, so, myth number four, Kufi is not Arabic. So, I heard, I haven't heard this recently, I heard this uh, in, when was it, 2007, in a newspaper in Holland, uh, where someone was complaining that some designs we had done were not Arabic enough because they were Kufi, which obviously is not correct. So, so Kufi is Arabic, Kufi is like, the name Kufi means coming from the city of Kufa in Iraq, so it's an it's an adjective, uh, and normally we use it for uh, like a collection of different calligraphic styles that have some uh, common link with how they are made. It's not a good name because they're not all coming from the city in Iraq, uh, but we call it Kufi anyways. Um, so it it contains many different styles. I am just going to show you an example because I, I love this uh, of square Kufi. 
um, with, which is what you see here and here, with another more organic style and fitting together quite nicely. And there is no conflict between the two. They're just two very different styles of one script, and it's totally fine. And we cannot say one is not Arabic. It is completely nonsense. So, so definitely not, not correct, and that myth needs to be put to rest. So myth number five, there is no strictly horizontal baseline in Arabic. Normally you hear this when people are complaining about the simplified NASF, which is, I will have examples to show you, uh, where the, the baseline is basically like in Latin, so completely horizontal. And, and people think this is not Arabic enough. This style came for technical reasons, uh, but it is part of our heritage now. But I also have examples of where it came from, which I, we can see from Kufi, for example. But what I wanted to show you here is, uh, now I start to show you typefaces that I've designed. <laughs> so let me just check the time again, because like, I'm so bad with this. I don't recognize my face. Okay. Ooh, I only have seven minutes left. Okay, so I have to go fast. Um, so this is a headline typeface that I designed for an Nahar newspaper in Lebanon, and it's based on simplified Arabic, and it's based on what is commonly used as a typographic headline style for, for Arabic newspapers. So this is completely traditional, and very much around a horizontal baseline, as you can see over here. This is strictly horizontal baseline, very much what we see in newspapers. There is, you know, we've been reading in this in my entire lifestyle, in my entire life, uh, definitely part of what we accept in Arabic today. So whether it used to be like this 200 years ago or not is, is no longer an issue because we are so used to it now. The question is, can it look good? And I hope we can say, yeah, this looks good, you know? So, so we sometimes, part of the revolution of the Arabic script has brought us things that were not there in the manuscripts that were written by hand 200 years ago. But what we can do today is check, is it legible, can it look good? And does anyone want to use this? And if we can say yes to all three, then I think we have a case to keep it. Um, this is an example of uh, the typeface it replaced. And so you can see there's not a lot of differences in terms of structure or in terms of um, you know, construction of words. So it's very traditional in that sense. But this is where the question of contemporary and modernity can look like. Because this looks quite old fashioned. But then this looks quite contemporary. And all that I did is reduce the contrast and then clean up how we treat these kinds of shapes. I mean, obviously the design is different, no, it's not the same design. But this kind of design brings a contemporary aesthetic, the way we draw typefaces today, where you don't have like nonsense kind of shapes, everything is very, you know, put in place. Uh, you, do, you don't have like spiky corners for nothing. It's, it's very clean. So generally, the way we draw typefaces today is just very clean. That's how we like to draw. And, and because I, I think the software today allows us to do that, maybe that's why it crept into our design aesthetic. But it, like at least to my eyes, we can see something here. Even though they're very similar, one looks very old-fashioned, and one looks more contemporary inside. Uh, this is what the character set looks like. And we can see here, like we do, have, we, we do see the influence of the pen movement. Uh, over here and here, but it's it's very much a sculptural approach, and it gives a bold design. This was uh, for the newspaper An Nahar. This is called Gibran 2005, after the name of the chief editor of the newspaper who was assassinated. His daughter redesigned the newspaper, and this was part of it as, as a message of perseverance in the face of political assassinations and pressure. So the typeface needed to be bold to reflect that. Uh, and that's why what we see over here, that was the whole concept. It means the mountain that will not be shaken by the wind. That was the whole concept of the typeface, the voice of the newspaper. And uh, this is the newspaper, the first issue that was with the new typeface and the new design. So I was there for that and like we left fingerprints on it because the ink was not dry, um, which is cool. Um, yeah, this is another typeface, which is also a long, uh, strictly horizontal baseline. So this is Amaria, which I designed a couple of years ago. And with this one, uh, all that I wanted to do is to design a typeface that is very easy to read. And how many people speak Arabic in the audience? Ah, amazing. Okay, so I don't know if you guys like it. <laughs> but the whole point is that this is easy to read on screen. It has low contrast. Again, there is nothing, not, and normally, I'm not showing you my work in the chronological order. Normally, I break all the rules and I do hybrids and things and whatever. But um, 
Thank you. Uh, with this one, I wanted to stay very traditional, but then make it very legible. And still, this one is based, again, on a horizontal baseline, and it still looks quite decent. It still reads quite nicely. And so, again, the question of can we have Arabic that looks good and have a strictly horizontal baseline? I hope we can say, yes, we can. Wow, like Obama. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I love the guy. But anyways. So, myth number six, Arabic cannot be simple. So, I will show this the other way around. Uh, Arabic is actually, ah, no, no, before, I have to be really, I have to speak really fast because four more to go through. So Arabic can be simple. This is where I show the hybrids, all the um, Neue Alvetica Arabic, the uh, Universe Next Arabic. Uh, this is Adrian Frutiger looking at the first example of Frutiger Arabic, which I show over here. Uh, we also did the Neue Frutiger Arabic uh, two years ago. Uh, this is the Avenir Arabic. So I have like all the Adrian Frutiger typefaces, I have Arabic companions too, almost. Um, and then we also have, uh, this is SST Arabic, uh, so within the same aesthetic as well. So an Arabic style that would work quite well in branding, that feels contemporary, that is simple the way it looks, but it, people have used these typefaces, they are all over the Middle East, particularly in Dubai. The moment I land in Dubai, they're everywhere. And it's nice for me, because uh, <laughs> I like to see my typefaces in use. And, and people have accepted it, and it's part of and what we do in design, and, and there is no, you know, there is no question like, ah, why is this not more complex than this? So I think this aesthetic fits quite well with what we want to design in the Middle East these days. Um, myth number seven, that Arabic is complex. This is true. The problem is that, actually I should have said it, that Arabic has to be complex. No, Arabic is complex, but doesn't have to be. So those two myths have to come together. We do have typefaces that are very simple, but we do have typefaces that are very complex. So here I'm going to show you something is complex. Uh, this is my PhD typeface, which is a set of three typefaces with varying degrees of complexity. I based it on um, a, a, a calligraphic reference from Ottoman calligraphy. Uh, and you can see over here, this is the original, and this is my drawing. And then again, over here, which is what I showed you before, uh, this is the manuscript, and this is what I designed. And uh, this is what the dynamic, so more complex, most complex style would look like. So again, you see letters jump on top of one another over here as well. I will show you some examples in a bit. And uh, these are the three different styles together. So what I call simplified, two shapes per word, uh, per letter. This one has four shapes per letter and a few ligatures. This is the traditional. This is often we see this in newspapers. And I'm speaking really in generalizations now. Um, and this is what we see in uh, books. And this is the manuscript, the most complex, where you have many different shapes per letter. And then things jump on top of one another. Um, for example, this is more or less, remember when we talked about the base ribbon, the base ribbon stays more or less flat. But in this case, we have much more, that's why we call it dynamic, dynamic stacking of letters next to one another. We see it over here as well, where we see this is one base, where they're almost all of them are on one base. But over here, we see that they jump and sort of make different levels. And then the spacing as well. In the traditional, they're more or less rhythmic, so a little bit how we space in Latin, so all at the equal space. When we go to dynamic, some of them become very close and some of them become very far from one another, so we have different rhythms. And this is part of the complexity as well. And over here, you can see this letter is this one, this letter becomes the bump, this rounded thing becomes the blob over here. So this is the dynamic, this is the simplified. It turns out the complex takes longer to read because any object, it turns out in any script, the more complex the shape, the longer it takes to read. That's the conclusion of five years of research. Uh, yeah, I could have told you before, but I needed to show, I needed data to show that. So anyways, it took five years and like one year of data analysis. Anyways, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but anyways, so, uh, yeah, this is one example. I say, here, so this is life. Um, I, I like to show this example always. And, and yeah, we do have complexity, but it doesn't have to be that Arabic can only be this. No. It is this, but it's also many other things as well. And this is also it reminds me of like when we talk about the Middle East and what Arabs uh, can be like. We are different people. Every city is different. We have commonalities, but we also have differences. There is not just one Arab. And um, yeah, we need to understand that we are many. And so stereotypes don't work, and they also don't work in type design. So myth number eight, Nasr is not modern. So this I've heard also, not, not so much recently, but we need to keep it in mind that no, no, we need to challenge this. 
This is the example, this is the Dubai font, which I designed for the executive, <laughs> executive Council of Dubai to be shipped with Microsoft Office 365. And it carries the name of Dubai the city and the locations of the city, Latin and Arabic together. I was the lead designer, I had other designers with me on the team. And um, yeah, it's, it's all about the harmony between the Latin and the Arabic. And, and coexistence on the same page. And the Arabic, again, is very no-nonsense. And that kind of aesthetic of simplicity uh, that we have within contemporary aesthetic is seen over here. And this is where it's important that just because it's not too complex does not mean that it doesn't come from the heritage that we have inherited. It can be Arabic and it can be contemporary at the same time. There is no, absolutely no problem with being contemporary, modern, and being Arabic at the same time. I think this is, the, if, if you come up with any like theme from my talk, it would be that there is no, no problem at all. And the, the only problem is when we look at the Middle East and we say they can only be traditional. And for me, that will always be a problem. No, you will have traditional people and you will have non-traditional and everything in the middle. And yeah, and we need to be able to accept that and to make space for that kind of uh, richness of expression. Um, this is um, me visiting Professor Herman Zaf to work on Zafino Arabic, but then this is also, uh, sorry, Palatino Sound Arabic, which I show over here again. This is Nasr, but it's cute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it works for like children's books and packaging, and it's a little bit more round. It's based upon the structures and proportions that are very classical, but it's treated in a way that is cute. So I, I, I didn't write that in the font description, but it's cute. Uh, this is another um, uh, Nasr typeface, uh, Shara al Hamra, where I grew up in Beirut, uh, Hamra Street. And again, it's, it's very much like the traditional Nasr kind of structures that we've inherited, but designed in a way that feels very street and very colloquial. Uh, it's really good for writing slang <laughs> and, and being informal, so that, that works. This is the other way to fit, uh, which again is very casual. And then this is another example that I've recently designed, which is, uh, honestly, this was an exploration of grief in type design, uh, but somehow it turned out that it looks beautiful and I don't understand why, but the, anyways, so I wanted the blackest you can draw with the smallest counters possible, and yet it came out looking like that. And could be contemporary, I don't know, but like I also love what I have drawn and I can't believe that I drew it. It feels like it drew itself. Mm. Um, and then finally, this is another uh, example of, uh, of, of Nas. How many minutes do I have left? Two minutes? Okay, almost, I'm wrapping up. Anyways, it's just one more slide. This is honestly how much politics I can speak. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I also like in my, in my intro, we forgot to say, I've recently, like literally last week, uh, Last week, two weeks ago, uh, passed my fourth degree, which is a master's in international relations at Cambridge. So, <laughs> and, uh, so I'm really interested in the intersection of politics and design. And this is one of the very few presentations that I've given that has been only design. So now I'm going to sneak some politics into it. So, um, but, and this is the space word, I think, uh, New York in that sense. So, Kafa Kariban means stop lying. And I designed this as part of a poster to protest Trump's visit to London in July 2018. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, that was that. We had the baby Trump, and that was me uh, protesting. And I wanted to design in Arabic. And I, the, the typeface needed to feel angry because I was really angry at him for his policies in the Middle East. His policies in the U.S. are horrible, and his policies in the Middle East are catastrophic. And people are dying because of that. And many more will die if he continues along that trend. So, so I particularly when it comes to the uh, the peace plan, I don't know if you guys know about that, and also the confrontation with Iran. He's messing up on both fronts, and like really, people will die because of that. So I'm very angry with him. So I wanted him to stop lying. So I, so the poster said, uh, <laughs> stop lying. So enough lying and enough hatred, which I think should be enough because this politics of division, I really there is no place for this. And and so I wanted to yell at him in Arabic. One, because he's xenophobic, so it will piss him off even more. And two, because when you're really angry and very emotional, you want to speak in your native tongue. So I, I had to design in Arabic. So then I designed this, and then it wasn't enough. So I completed the font uh, for the 2018 midterm elections. 
uh, because I couldn't vote, and it was so important to like get the Senate, and we don't have the Senate. We, as I'm like, I'm probably a Democrat, even though I can't vote here, but uh, but we really need the Senate. So and we didn't get it, and that's why everything is shit. So um, <laughs> yeah, so so um, so I, I made the font freely available. It's a protest font. It's called Kafa, which means enough. And so you guys, if you want to protest him, you, you can just download the font and do whatever you like. And uh, that's the end of it. So thank you, and please vote. Yeah. <laughs> questions at the end? Okay, so because now I need to introduce the next speaker, uh, if I can still speak. Okay, so, uh, super excited about the next one. So, uh, Wael is also Lebanese, uh, so um, Wael is a graphic, I'm just going to read because by now I don't remember even my own name, uh, is a graphic designer and type designer from Beirut, Lebanon. Upon receiving his BA in graphic design from Notre Dame University in, in Lebanon, he spent three years developing identities and Arabic Latin bilingual typefaces in addition to working in print and exhibition design. Wael received his MFA from RISD in 2013, after which he moved to New York and worked with several studios in the city before founding Morkuski. Wael has been featured in print magazine as 15 under 30, uh, was named a young gun by the Art Directors Club and an ascender by the Tech Directors Club. I'm super excited to see what Wael has to say. I have tons of questions for you after, but please help me welcome Wael to this video. Wael needs like one minute to set up his computer. So I'm just going to sit and chat. Actually, let's take a question while Wael is. Um, yes. Uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the constraints of designing you know, a digital space. Because I noticed, I mean, I'm not an average reader. Yes. But I did notice that some of the horizontal length of the characters yeah. then went lower so that the character as opposed to stretched out. And I wonder whether if they were concerned about fitting in a digital setting yeah. that caused you to, yeah. Uh, do, do you remember which show? Well, there was a character that was like this, and then it became like this. You know what I mean? It became a more, it had more of a vertical Oh, oh, like when we put two things on top of one another. Well, but it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't too, two characters on top of each other, it was a character that was changed from yeah. having a long horizontal to having something below the baseline. Oh, it's Fiji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the very long one, that's the swash, the same we have in Latin. So that's just a decorative device. So you could decide if you want to have a swash character or not. That's just, you. it depends how much space you want to have. If you have a lot of space, you want to fill it up, you have a swash. But swashes are only in only used in particular set of typefaces because they have to be a little bit more elegant and decorative. Most typefaces will not have swash characters. So, but yeah, it's possible. Anyways, so yeah, please, uh, on to when. Hi, 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 hi. How are we? Good. Um, my name is Wael. Uh, first of all, thank you, the Center for the Book Art, for including me. Thank you, Nadine, for creating this amazing group of people and having me part of it. I'm very excited today to share with you uh, my work at the studio. I'm a partner at the studio called Morcos Key. I'm the Morcos part and my partner Key is the other part. Um, the whole presentation is basically an exploration of what our studio practice looks like and why we did it and the kind of work we take on and how we manage through all of that. And I think the practice in all is a sort of a hybrid because I'm originally from Lebanon and John is from Alabama, and we met at RISD when we were both doing our uh, degrees in graphic design, and then after that we moved to New York, worked with a couple of studios, and then we decided to create a space where we can actually create work that we are really interested, excited about, but also work for people that we can relate to and that looks like us. So we created a studio, we called it Morcos Key. Uh, three years ago we had our launch party, that's our vanity shot from our launch party, looking snazzy and all. Um, our studio focuses on a lot of different things, including identities and editorial design and multi-script typography. Uh, I think one through line that goes through all of our work is that we use typography and storytelling as a major device and a tool in the toolkit of a designer to work around the complexities of the stories that we're trying to tell. Uh, design posters are also something that we love to do, uh, so you see a lot of that 
that we're showing right now. <clears throat> Another thing that we just, we wanted to create our own studio is to open ourselves for collaborations with a lot of people. So I'm going to name a lot of people that we collaborate with on different projects tonight. This is one of them, the Arabic Lettering Workshop Series uh, with Christian Setkis and Khazak Apelion. Uh, these are the sort of workshops that we've started doing around and the goal is to explore the expressive nature of Arabic typography and uh, lettering every time we get a chance to explore that with people. So each, uh, theme, each workshop has actually one different theme that allows us to focus on one aspect and we create the poster for these lectures as well. Different type of projects are a lot of identities. Uh, this is a bakery in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn by Syrian refugees. Uh, this is an identity for a Kaftan uh, house uh, in Saudi Arabia that I designed the logo for. Here are some postcards. I'm gonna go over some couple of projects really quickly and then dive in and four projects a little bit more in detail. This is an identity for Sura Film Festival, a queer Middle East and North African film festival in Berlin. Um, you can see the abstraction of the letter saw that became a framing device, but also like the uh, movie screen or the uh, frame. A logo for the rapper Mona Haidar, and that can then be applied to her different album covers. Uh, so we use typography to tell these little stories that sometimes are exist as poster or album covers, but then sometimes they become mini brands for special events. Uh, like this one when we worked with the Studio Museum in Harlem to design their uh, 2018 fundraiser gala which was supposed to be a, a black tie event but also where people get to dance and celebrate so the design is a little bit somber and serious but also has a little bit of fun with it so we built on the previous identity that was designed by 2x4 and OCD and added the 50 years on top of it and created a brand Mark for gala 2018 that breaks itself up and floats around all the event, and then all of that was applied on collaterals, you know, fundraising forms, animation on screen during the event. Yeah, and we got our logo to be displayed next to Obama that we also love. Uh, we worked with Nike in the past to create lettering pieces for their campaign. This is uh, was for the campaign, I believe, last FIFA Cup. What Nike was doing is mini campaigns for each of the countries that were participating in uh, the tournament. So that was for Saudi Arabia, this is the, the national football team of Saudi Arabia. It's uh, based on the geometric kufi that's a little bit abstracted and modernized in its details. That was then adapted into the swash and then included into their campaign, into uh, visuals and their posters. So we created different kind of like typographic lockups and other signature for them to use across the campaign. So we were doing the typography work and they were doing the art direction. and all the rest of the work. Uh, this is the type of collaboration that you saw. So sometimes big international studios, studios would come to us for our expertise in the language and sometimes something a little bit more local but still in New York. So we tend to collaborate with studios here also in New York that also work with us for our expertise in, in you know, the Middle Eastern culture. Um, this is one of them. So I don't know if you know the artist Cause. He does a lot of these very big paintings and takes a lot of very uh, 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 cartoon characters that he then reworks uh, into original art pieces, including these huge sculptures. And something that's very particular about his style that's big and chunky, but also soft, and also has a bit of, of, of uh, innocence to it. So 2x4 was in charge of designing the exhibition space at the, Doha, uh, the fire station in Doha in Qatar. And we came in as a support to design the identity for the exhibition. So we built on the theme of the exhibition of these destabilizing big blocks and they created typography that can resonate with that. It's still big and chunky and powerful, but still has these soft corner and really wiggly little bit of pieces. Um, this is again was another example of where we can come in and then design the identity and then send hand it over to the marketing team of the gallery that follow the guidelines that we set, how to use the type with paintings, how to use it with the sculptures, how to combine these. And then you get to see it again in a indoor mall with a painted sky on the ceiling. Here we go back to Doha. This is the lettering on the title of the exhibition, and this is how also the typography was uh, worked out to take uh, all the facade of. That's John being funny in front of it. <laughs> you can see how also the concept of the stabilized typography and multiple baseline is carried through by the architecture team at 2x4, including the display cases that contain some of the art. Um, more branding stories. Uh, Mizna is uh, 
uh, art and culture institution here in the U.S. documenting stories uh, of uh, Arab American through art and prose and poetry. Uh, this is an existing identity, uh, and it's based on this really beautiful, abstracted kind of logo. But the problem is, as they grew and they started uh, operating on different levels, they had a Posca, they had a film festival, they had a journal. Uh, their brand started a little bit disintegrating and coming apart when they had to replicate it on different ways. So they came to us in a way to look at how we can bring that brand back together and refresh all their identity. So we wanted to keep that symmetry that exists in the original logo that they had that you see here on top. And the symmetry between the meme at the beginning, the hat at the end, and the space in the middle. And create some typography that is a little bit more related to it. And find a way that we can create a system to align all of that together. So we started by just re redrawing their logo, creating something more streamlined, more simple, more geometric, and then really banking on the symmetry in the logo. And when it came to giving back life to something that could be dynamic, we used the tatwil, uh, which is the technique in Arabic where you elongate the baseline, whether to create dramatic layouts or to justify things. But that can be uh, the, uh, the, the uh, driving force behind this identity. And the idea is that you can play with the logo, you can elongate it, it can occupy different spaces, but most of all, it can also act as a masthead on all types of layout that they can do. And they can elongate it as long as, as much as they need, and that would be the the, the uh, connecting graphic elements between all the communication. So <clears throat> this is the new identity uh, applied on their different collaterals. This is how it can be uh, a mass head for a different type of content that they're working on. This is what it can live on their website, and also on their printed journals. It can also act as a headliner on top of everything they do. This is the application on, uh, I think, two years ago, their issue about uh, the Palestine issue. And when it came to starting applying this identity to the different programs, for example, the film festival, we went back to the same idea of this elongation in the baseline, and it became like a framing device up top and above. Now it acts like a film strip. And even though it, when it animates, it becomes more so and becomes alive, and you can see how the uh, fixed typography on top of the bottom kind of allows it to be seen and understood as that. So our collaboration with Mizna has been uh, ongoing. They're an amazing team. They're based in Minnesota. You should check them out. Uh, we also created special graphics for the film festival uh, awards, the laurels based on uh, olive leaves that can be used to kind of create these graphics for the awards for the winners every year. Um, this is part of their film festival. This is Representative Ilhan Omar. It's almost fun to see a logo next to her. She makes it look even better. Yes. Um, that's like a brand example for an NGO here in the state. Um, our studio is also dedicated to research specifically in typography and Arabic type design. And some of the collaboration we get are very specific. And that is a translation of a brand mark into Arabic. And sometimes that can become a more larger typeface exercise. Some of the collaborations we've had were, uh, are with commercial type, a type foundry here in New York City. Um, I was totally a big fan of them. When I moved to this city, I emailed them and I started freelancing with them on small little things. And eventually that collaboration grew into different logo adaptations that we did uh, for the brands that they were working on. Uh, one of the, my really favorite projects with them is Graphic Arabic, where we got to translate this really grotesque Latin Arabic, uh, uh, Latin typeface into an Arabic system. Um, so. I'm going to show a couple of typefaces, and I'm going to dive into the process of one of them, not this one. So, But what I want you to take from this one is this specimen that we eventually designed for the typeface. And the goal was to create this little booklet that we can give to people. And like any type specimen, its goal is to show how we can use this typeface in different type of layouts, from something that reinterprets a traditional uh, liberated manuscript like this one, something, something a little bit more modernist and simple, more functional grids, flat layout of just one weight and different scripts, and this is um, graphic Arabic, available for licensing. <laughs> um, this is one of my first typefaces ever. I started in 2010 with typographic matchmaking uh, that's organized by Huda Al-Fadis. I was really fascinated by one of the uh, Eastern Kufi um, that originated in Kufa in what is today modern-day Iraq. Uh, I was really fascinated by these elongated horizontals. One of the very special things about uh, Kufi script is that um, 
this really rhythm and writing that kind of coalesce some places and then extends in other. So I wanted to create something that kind of mimics and uh, reinterprets that as something that is more usable today, more modern, and less inky. Um, part of the project, which has a bigger background story, I'm not going to go into that now, is collaborating with a, uh, another designer. So my partner was Artur Schmann, and he's the one who designed the Latin. And both typefaces were designed from scratch to work together, and the process was really something that uh, it was really eye-opening to experience for the first time, whereas we were drawing some shapes in Latin that were influencing the Arabic, and then we see some details in Arabic that would influence back to Latin. And we like to keep on doing this like push and pull to find some uh, sweet middle part where we're both happy with the typeface. Um, so this typeface has been recently acquired by Google. It's been remastered and about to be released uh, as open license fonts, so you can also find it on Google Fonts soon, hopefully by 20 before the end of this year. This is an attempt to uh, play with variable fonts and see how it can serve the concept of Kufam as a typeface with elongated horizontals in the middle of the word. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Arabic typography has a, has a very contentious relationship with technology, even till today, with variable fonts technology that doesn't support Arabic as it should be and doesn't work in all the software. So hopefully this will change soon. Adobe, if you're hearing us. <laughs> Um, another Arabic typeface, Brando Arabic, uh, that was under the direction of Mike Abing from Bold Monday. Uh, Brando is a Latin typeface that comes in brand serif and Brando sans. And one of the conversations we're having is that the concept of serif and sans does not apply or work in Arabic. Eventually, we decided to create an Arabic and think of it as the third sibling of Brando. So you have Brando serif, Brando sans, and Brando Arabic. And the goal was to kind of uh, find that sweet spot where we can also marry these curved but geometric structures into Brando. Um, and this is the printed specimen for Brando. Um, I'm not gonna go deeper in detail because I can speak for days about this. The font I'm gonna just dive a little bit more into is the latest font we created for IBM Arabic. Um, IBM used to have um, a, some typefaces of the license for their brand, but because it's such a big company, they have so many uh, machines everywhere, they have to pay constant licenses. So eventually the fee was so high and they decided to kind of do an internal rebrand to uh, create a new brand language and with that create a new typeface that they can own. Um, so Mike Abing that you see on the top left is the design director at IBM, uh, put together a team of designers, each an expert in their own script, including Cyrillic, Hebrew, Thai, and then Nagari, and this is me on top middle. And this is my collaborator, Fajak Apirion, who's a tech designer in Lebanon. And I should mention that all the Arabic typeface design that I do are usually in collaboration with Fajak, including Brando, Graphic, and this one, and the one we're going to see in a little bit. The concept of the uh, IBM typeface was a riff on the IBM logo that was designed by Paul Rand. The idea that it would mirror and combine something that is natural and engineered as a human and machine at the same time. And uh, that has these characteristics that you see here, which is <clears throat> geometric ending at some point, a curve that's so special, it's curved on the inside, and then right angle on the uh, outside inside, and then some pointiness to it. You can boil down to only these three principles that are translated to a lot of different scripts. When it comes to Arabic, uh, Typographic matchmaking is such an elastic word, and every type designer has their own approach to come to terms with what it means and how to operate. To me, it's two things. Matching it formally, that it needs to look that it's drawn by the same tool. And two, it needs to be able to operate the same way. So if the Latin type, uh, typeface is meant to be displayed in big sizes, the Arabic should operate in that way. Um, if it's meant to go on small sizes for running text, the Arabic needs to operate in that way too. So the goal is to match these two things and make sure it looks like the Latin but operates like the Latin should operate, but is still Arabic. <clears throat> to summarize our process is basically breaking down all the design principles of the Latin and rebuilding the Arabic from scratch using these principles as a drawing guidance. So one of the things, several, we look at several things. One of these things is First and most important is the contrast. Um, the ribbon, baseline, I'm gonna steal that. Such a good metaphor, the base ribbon uh, in Arabic. It's, so, it's uh, so interesting because it's usually the thicker one that carries the weight of the font. 
Um, whereas in, in Latin, the stems are usually very uh, the thicker part of the letter. You can see here in this diagram. Thicker part, thin part. Thicker part, thin parts. That's what we call contrast. Um, most scripts in Arabic, except some of the Kufi families, have a contrast where the base line is thicker. So to get some naturally looking Arabic following the convention that we're used to, it makes sense to reverse the contrast. We also look on what we call excite. There's no excite in Arabic, but this uh, area of the word is where a lot of the information happens. A lot of the new, uh, knots and uh, bolts and eyes and nebiras or teeth also happen. So it's uh, an area that we need to kind of exaggerate and work around with. Obviously, the diacritic dots carry a lot of the um, flavor of the Arabic, whether they need to be diamond or circular. The counters, Arabic tend to have triangular counter versus round ones, and they tend to be much smaller, so there needs to be work on that too. The rhythm of nebiras is something that we also consider that gives you that really steady rhythm in Latin. In Arabic, it's much more organic, so you also have to kind of create, look at these negative spaces between the letters and between the, the nebiras. And, try to harmonize them as much as possible. And more specifically for uh, Plex, IBM Plex, the tech is called Plex, I can say that. For Plex, one of the major characteristics in the design was, again, the straight on the inside and the curved on the outside concept. So we had to translate that into a turn baseline that it happens on the uh, baseline ribbon. <laughs> totally stealing that. <clears throat> um, um, another thing that we also wanted to integrate is the ending of some of the letters in flex that end in that, you know, straight thing here. And find places where that can happen naturally in the Arabic. Instead of adding serif to letters, we can find inky endings that happen as the uh, traditional calligraphy that we can reinterpret. How two uh, curves merge into each other is also one characteristic of flex that creates that inky ink trap that happens here. How we can translate that. Eventually, we find a way to solve that straight on the inside kind of connection and translate it into the baseline and draw the letters in a very specific way so that even though the connection between one letter and the other is smooth and seamless, it still forms one big curve on the outside and still has this segment that's straight on the inside. Fast forward nine months later, the, the typeface is done, has nine, uh, eight weights. Uh, it supports almost more than 69 languages, even a lot of uh, the extinct languages or script uh, languages that we don't use anymore. It's very versatile in its like weights and how it can be used. It includes some religious uh, uh, glyphs that are as one glyph and one ligature. And my favorite part of this whole project is that IBM decided to give it away for free. So if you go on GitHub, you can find all the family for IBM Plex, Arabic, and the other scripts also for free uh, for commercial licenses. You can just download it, use it for clients, for yourself, for whatever you want. <clears throat> okay, last typeface design project is this one that I'm very, very excited about, but I don't have a lot to say yet because it's not released. Our latest collaboration with Khajak Apelion and commercial type is the Arabic version of Lyon Arabic. Lyon is a text face. Uh, that's meant for smaller sizes and long uh, text, but also has a beautiful italic that's very fluid. And here we wanted to play with a newish concept, and that is instead of slanting the design that we did for the uh, for the upright, just like the Latin is a cursive one that's completely redrawn for a different hand movement. We're gonna uh, use a different drawing for the italic version of the Arabic. So this one is an interpretation of Nesq, and this is a hybrid of Nesq and Nastariq, which is some, a different script that is much more fluid, much faster, and has different uh, baselines, that makes, and has a slant also in it. So it makes sense that as a starting point to interpret for an italic, how many? How many? Five. <gasps> okay. Yes. Okay, the fun part about, you know, doing that part of research in our studio is that we can get to play with these fonts and test them in projects that we've done. Uh, recently, we've designed the two books for the Charger Architectural Triennial titled The Rights of the Future Generation that was uh, curated by Adrian Lahoud. Um, the two books are one in English and one in Arabic, and the design is very simple. They mirror each other. They have these opening spreads where typography play a major role, and these other text pages and we use the italic concepts that you can see on the opening pages for both languages to start to play with the hierarchies and see how different 
type of Arabic fonts can interact within the layout and solve different kind of complexities like how do you do footnotes that start in Arabic and then turn into English and then sometimes you have websites that you have to break in different line of languages. It can be a little bit too nerdy. <laughs> it can be also fun. Um, there's a lot also to say about this story. I'm just going to keep going. <clears throat> Uh, something we've also been doing recently are exhibition design. Uh, another uh, project that I also get to test the full force of the Young Arabic that's about to be released is this exhibition by the Jan Tabit of the Storefront for Architecture here in New York City. Um, this exhibition imagines a speculative meeting between an American architect and a French historian over a century after they were both at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Um, the exhibition featured a sculpture made by stacking 20 original redwoods from the architect and uh, this book from the, the Lettre de Précis Arabe that was written by the historian that spent his life uh, touring the Middle East and taking notes of the architectural things that he was seeing that later came to be coined as Arabesque, although that term was not included in Arabic. Uh, our role was to create an identity for the exhibition and the graphics on the wall inside. So this was a sketch that we refined and worked on in collaboration with the artist. His idea was to add the Latin word inside the Arabic. And the coolest thing is that we got to put this huge arabesque word on the whole storefront of a Manhattan block. It goes from one side to the other and opens in the middle for the door of the exhibition to go in. Um, that concept of elongation and reaching out from one culture to the other and influencing one of them was also uh, present in the way we treated the layout and the typography inside the exhibition, whether they are on the walls where you can see the elongations again are used as a justification method to meet the Arabic and Latin meet at the middle using the italic to create hierarchies for the biography of the artist, more walls, and it also came with a broad sheet that we translated all these typographic concepts into a printed, foldable print. Okay, last project, I just had more time. Okay, uh, last year we also worked... <laughs> all right. Um, last year we got to collaborate with the Northwestern University in Qatar, a uh, very cool school, and they have something called the Media Majlis, which is a gallery inside the uh, school, and they put on exhibitions every time. So they called on us to help them create an identity for this exhibition, and they wanted something that reimagined a little bit the space, more than it does in previous, previous exhibitions, so it feels different. Um, this exhibition was called Meet Their Revolutions in the Middle East, and what's so cool about it is that it surveys different uh, movements and the influence of media and technology into creating social political change. So they map things like feminist movement in the 1940s in Egypt, till today's user, uh, use, usage of internet and YouTube, and till the Arab Spring that happened recently. And we had to find some sort of language that unified all these different artifacts with like one big umbrella and communicate it clearly to the visitor. All on top of that, we have to convince them that they have to keep the identity of the measures that they have, but they have to invest in creating a new visual language for the exhibition itself. So we did this some sort of diagram to say, this is the identity for the graphic, for the museum. So we kind of come up with another symbol, and so, uh, another uh, language, or some sort of symbols. These are just placeholder things. And then we're going to create a big title for the exhibition. We're going to combine these things together. They're going to be built inspired by the existing identity to create something new but still relatable to the museum. So we took the color coral and we made it the hero for this exhibition. And then when it came to create some sort of graphic visual concept for the identity, we went to uh, um, magazines and layouts and looked at how they can create these hierarchies and how they use these isolator boxes to create these highlights of things. Uh, it looked just like a very indicative thing of a conversation that's still in flux and that's still happening and communicates the urgency of too much information to process at the same time. It also looks like the news sticker that you see at the, at the bottom of your TVs that contains this information. So we took that idea concept of uh, the isolators and news stickers and then combining with typography that is usually associated with headlines and newspapers. So for the Latin, we went with a very condensed, all caps sort of typeface, similar to something like that that allows a lot of condensing of words on one line. And for the Arabic, we went to something similar to what you just showed, the, which is a, a Nasr Mastari, which is a type of Nasr that has a very straight, thick baseline. And the goal of these fonts are really to catch you as a headline, to create impact, and to be there and thick and proud. 
Um, again, we collaborate with Khazak Apelion to create a custom typeface. Uh, actually, Khazak has already been working on this typeface. It's fully his. Um, but it made a lot of sense to use it for this exhibition. So we, we took that typeface and we started creating the identity based on that. So the Arabic logo would have the title of the uh, exhibition and then the museum font, which I believe is Jannam, designed by Nadine Shaheen, is the museum font that is used at the, in, in conjunction with the exhibition font. How it be applied in the Latin context? How these things come together to create a, a strong, clear typographic signature? And then breaking back the isolators as a way to create a lockup that can exist in different ways. That was the start for the identity that we got them to sign on, on and go with. And when you see it uh, in context, we wanted to create a very strong visual marker that allows you to be drawn into the center. And then the graphics are applied on the outside hoarding with new stickers, with questions that kind of pro probe the visitor to kind of start thinking what's behind that wall of the exhibition, like go in and visit it. Once you go inside, you encounter these screens and are in this big armature, the title walls, and these uh, boxes. And this section here uh, looks at traditional media, from storytelling in public squares, to uh, theater, to uh, radio, and how these influence uh, and diversify through time. <clears throat> Another big feature of this space is this huge armature that, uh, I don't know how many screens that wrap up and go all the way down. So we knew we had to activate them visually in some sort of way that connects the theme. But the user cannot reach these, they cannot interact with them. So they have to be more like graphic fillers for the space. So we created different scenarios, we call them acts, uh, as a way to activate these uh, screens. And then we worked with the curator to pull some of the content that was in these screens that you have to go touch and then put it outside and blow it up on the armature. Some of it uh, highlighted the type of media that is used the, the, uh, inside the artifacts. Some were uh, kind of like a, a, an overview of all the countries that are surveyed and present in the exhibition. Another one is looking at headlines and content and themes that happen throughout the exhibition and the different section of the exhibition. And again, take these snippets like news, like little tweets, if you will, like headlines and blowing them up in the screens and create these typographic blockups on each screen. And some of them were just pure visual videos and screens kind of mishmashed, disintegrating into each other. And they kind of work exactly as we imagined them. They have a really big impact as you go the space. They color the whole space. And as they change, they have different stories that come through when you can see them. The center theatre was uh, uh, also a place where you go sit and uh, hear. <laughs> um, on this side of the exhibition uh, had this uh, big uh, horseshoe theater kind of wall. And uh, that was the section for uh, society, politics, and the creative media. And <laughs> we created this video with the help of Mo, who's here. Mo was working at a studio back then. He helped a lot with the graphics for all these screens. Um, some of the themes in, is it not played? There it is. Uh, the screens are divided. So we use that grid to our advantage to create these divisions where we can put in our contact, uh, contact content and the tackle themes such as uh, media and women, issue of representation, media and pan-Arabism, civil liberties and life under occupation. So this is still from the video. The other parts of the exhibition are deep dive screens. So created these little windows that you see, these graphics so you can like interact with them and they become like titles that dive you into the exhibition. And again, they were color coded and they correspond to different themes of these different um, deep dives. So these are like the hooks that take you to click on them and go that deep and discover videos and articles and more text. Uh, the north wall was a big interactive wall and looked at the, all the technical uh, media revolution and the internet and how technology played a role with that. There is also a section for the power of the posters. So we created what we um, think like a, a, a street a wall that was brought into the museum with this uh, uh, alignment of the posters and on your way out you have this interactive wall this magnetic stickers where you can actually take one and reposition it and have feel that you are involved in the conversation for this museum which brings me to my last slide thank you Thank you, uh, that was amazing, right? I'm, I'm not the only one who was like shocked off. Yeah, you can. Think. 
So while uh, our next speaker is setting up, uh, thank you again, Wael. That was really brilliant. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm very jealous because I only get to do pipe design. I don't get to use colors. So I only like have black and white on my screen ever. And, like I miss colors, but I'm a terrible graphic designer. So yeah, thank God I found something I'm good at. So <laughs> anyways, so I'm also super excited about our next speaker. So I will read the bio and then I will tell you the story how I met Thomas. Um, so our next speaker is Thomas Rogan. He is the founder of Type Thursday. Uh, how many of you know Type Thursday? Excellent. The rest of you, take note. Type Thursday is this amazing, amazing. Uh, actually, I'm going to read it now. So, Type Thursday is a global super family that converges monthly to help one another improve our letter forms over drinks. So, what, what more do you want? Maybe crisps and yeah, pizza. But yeah, the monthly events around the world start with social time and drinks, followed by a moderated group critique of in progress projects that focus on letter form design and or usage. The audience may receive, give, or simply listen to feedback. Um, Thomas is an adjunct lecturer at City University of New York, Queens College, uh, City College and State University of New York Fashion Institute of Technology. He is also a practicing typeface designer. Previous clients include Google, Express, Foot Locker and Microcores. Thomas's fonts are available on Google Fonts, Adobe Fonts and other distributors for you to use. And I met Thomas, we said 2009, right? I was giving, yeah, yeah it's like the coming together of everything. So. Um, I uh, gave a workshop on Arabic type design at TDC in 2009. Thomas was one of the participants, and now he is this amazing type designer, and we've worked together on projects. And uh, when I was putting together the program for our sessions today, I was thinking, oh my god, we need to show and pay tribute to uh, really uh, an international institution which is based here in New York, which is Type Directors Club, represented by Carol. Carol is TDC, in effect. <laughs> Um, so, for those of you who are not type designers, surely you have heard one way or another of Type Directors Club. It is the place that celebrates excellence in typography, in type design, and you've, you know you've made it if you win an award from TDC. That's why on my bio, they asked me to shorten it, but I will never take out like two awards from TDC. That is always in there. And it's, it's really a mark of excellence. It's an institution that we love and we see regularly at conferences. It brings together people and uh, the awards that they do, the competitions, it really sets the mark of what is good in design. And I thought that if we can look back at the contributions uh, to this awards, uh, to these awards and to have a highlight of these 20 or 22 years, Yes, in uh, in awards, and to have a capture of like a, a little preview of what really was good and designed and awarded in the last 22 years. So almost two decades, a little bit more than two decades of uh, award-winning TDC Arabic typefaces. Uh, I thought of Thomas, given all the history and, and our work together. And thank you so much, Thomas, for giving this presentation and overview. And I now pass it on to you, and then we'll have questions after. Hi everyone. Hi. Hey. So first of all, thank you Nadine for this chance to talk. Thank you for the Center for the Book Arts for the invitation to be here to host us. And thank you the audience for this, having this conversation together with me. Uh, as Nadine kind of laid out, this is a survey cross-section of the history of winners in typeface design at the TDC. Awesome. Well, I'm pressure that Carol's here. <laughs> Uh, so just more context on me, I am a half Egyptian born American, I, my mother's Egyptian, uh, but I wasn't raised with learning Arabic, so I learned it later in my life. So just a note that many of these names I'm, I'm going to survey, I, may, I only know if you read from text, so I don't know their pronunciation. So if I make an error, great apologies for that. So the TDC, whom I'm, I'm going to abbreviate as that for the rest of this talk, has three missions, recognizing excellence, supporting growth, and building community. For the sake of recognizing excellence, the TDC organizes annual judged competitions in communication design and typography. But our story begins, and the survey begins, in 1998, where a decision was made. The president of TDC at the time, James Montabano, with, James, with design historian Paul Shaw, persuaded TDC to separate typeface design submissions from the general design competition. The, there were judgments before, prior pre to this time at TDC, this wasn't a separate category, a separate jury, a separate judgment, 
an award given. Uh, this is the start of what is referred to as TDC2, Type Directors Club, Typeface Design Competition, TC2. So I'll be referring to it as such for this talk. And it's telling that when I reviewed the collection, went to the library of TDC and reviewed the archives from there, from 1998 to today, it's telling that in that very first TDC2 competition, an Arabic typeface design was selected as a winner. Arabic was not this foreign other that just doesn't have any record in the history. It does, and that's the purpose of this lecture, is to make honor of that and recognize it. In fact, when we look at the distribution of awards according to year over my survey, uh, we find that of the 22 years in total in survey, 18 years do have at least one representation of an Arabic typeface. There are seven years where there is either a one winner, that's Arabic, or two winners, so that covers 14 years in total so far, and the remaining four had three winners. So there's a surprisingly robust representation of Arabic in the awards over the two decades. If we proceed forward with the nominal style breakdown, so if we break this down, the winners again in their categories based on nominal style. Uh, a word on this, I'm mostly relying on what the designers named. There were about three editorial decisions I made about grouping of these styles. They were referenced in the lecture so far. This is actually quite useful because by this kind of intersection of what gets grouped in these buckets, we might have a better understanding of what con construes these styles, especially as Nadine commented, Kufi is a grab back term that meant one thing by location, but then over time has been abstracted to be a general formal quality. The styles we're going to be covering that I've subdivided the survey against is Roka, Kufi, Nask, Makrib, and Nasalik. Uh, Nask does have a subcategory due to formal quality distinctions and the and a pattern designers making a name distinction, but for the sake of the survey, I grouped them together. And in fact, when we break down the survey against that, we do see some very surprising results very quickly. The first one is the vast representation of Nas compared to the other styles. Uh, even if we did divide Nas into the subcategories of traditional and hybrid, it still would be a majority against the other styles. But returning back to that winning first design in 1998, we have Russian-born typeface designer and calligrapher Ludvo Kunets. <laughs> I was like, getting that Arabic ready, but the Russian threw me. Um, <laughs> Rufo Kunetsuba uh, produced P.T. Kufi based on a thorough study of classical Arabic calligraphy and modern Arabic typeface, typefaces in the Kufi style. This is clearly the more decorative sourcing, kind of drawn, rendered form of Kufi that I discussed before. Moving on, in 2002, the next edition of Mahmoud Sakal, who's speaking in one of the nights, so it's very exciting to have a person who's represented a lot in these annuals coming to speak in this salon series. Uh, his design was Sakal Seda Pro. This appeared in Typography 24 in 2002. From a press release in, when they were in partnership with Bitstream, there was a reference that the style was based on Eastern Kufi styles. It wasn't specified what it was and what we mean by that in the survey, but there was some representations in Wild's survey presentation earlier. Next is Khabib Khori and with Al Raji, uh, Typography 29. This is appeared in 2007. Now this is a fun one on personal preference. Uh, Laura Asua Kori uh, with ta uh, Tabati in Typography 32, 2010. It's really fun because it's incredibly graphic. Uh, it does generally follow some concepts. I'll talk about what makes this Kufi versus others, but it's incredibly geometric, kind of rectilinear circles and half cuts. It's incredibly graphic and impression. And lastly, in this subcategory, in this category of vision, we have Jamal Bastan with Mahmoud Sakal uh, with Bastan. And this appeared twice. I think there was an addition of weights. That's why there's two countings of this. In typography 36 and 37, 2014 and 15, respectively. Uh, this is inspired by a cursive sumuli and a uh, kuwani kufi. So different, different genres of, of kufi were kind of put together for this interpretation. If we invest, if you compare the letter B, I have an initial, middle, and end, we might be able to help discern some, some ideas about what makes Kufi Kufi. Uh, the first thing is, uh, also by the way, that this general is a grab back term means there's some diversity, I'm going to point that out too. So one is the tooth, the teeth we've been discussing. 
Uh, clearly, there's a diversity in terms of the solutions. We have kind of this kind of uh, kind of horn kind of stem kind of shape on the top of the DT Kufi. Meanwhile, on the far left, your your left uh, on Seda, we have this kind of strict shear cutting it through. And then we have a stand in the middle, this kind of S-shaped curvature treatment on the tooth. So they're the same letter that I've repeated three times, beginning, middle, end, but their formal rendering is very different against each other. Uh, they do are similar in terms of their general shapes are the same, right? The decision was made for PT Kufi to have the initial form is repeated in the middle and the end tooth. And the, likewise with Seda, similar shapes and plus stand as well. Now their heights do vary in their solutions. PT Kufi has a consistency across the all the tooth heights while Seda does have descending height, each one is basically lower than the one prior to it. Meanwhile, but then there's a variation where it appears the, middle, the initial and the end are equal in height, but the middle form, the middle bit, is raised up higher up. So it goes to show that even in this category, there are a multiplicity of solutions possible in the style of Kufi. Uh, also, this commentary about this regular baseline that's been discussed uh, by Nadine and Wada. Uh, the mostly they are following mostly that idea of a very flat baseline. We're seeing that across most of the set. Uh, but since I've done variation, it does show there actually is still some energy. There's still necessarily you don't necessarily need to have this kind of angular rigid load. It's the general assumption, but necessarily the only way. Next, with I'll use Gain as the example, in the beginning, middle, and end form, and discuss the decisions of the shapes, so there's a diversity in solutions. For example, with PT Kufi on your right, uh, notice there's a diversity in the initial, middle, and end forms. The initials is open C shape, and the middle is this diamond shape, and the end is this kind of upside down triangle shape on this, this item above the baseline. Meanwhile, with Bustani, Bustan, excuse me, uh, is the same shape, basically repeated. There's some change in height and, and proportion, but its overall shape is the same, Seja Pro does a mid, kind of a middle ground state. The initial form is a, like an open shape, and the middle and end forms are these similar shapes, this kind of triangle, upside down triangle shape on the ascender position. Their approach of their descenders on the terminal Gaian is, is distinctly different. In PT Kufi, we probably, more, uh, I know, definitely source based on its sourcing, the kind of floral kind of bifurcation at the terminal at the bottom of the base and that descender area for Gain's final form in PT Kufi. Notice the change of decisions made in Seda and Gosan. Seda, Seda has this kind of consistency of weight and is going down and terminating horizontally, but then it kind of thins out relatively quickly and its main heavy elements at the baseline area and it thins out to a thin descending down. Moving on to NASC, this is obviously the most represented group in the category in the survey. Mamun Sokol appears again with Paul Nelson and John Hudson. And the name is Arabic typesetting. This appeared in Typography 24 in 2002. Mamun Sokol appears again in the next year with Microsoft Uber, I believe it's how you pronounce it, uh, in Typography 25. Uh, of interest, this is a region of China. This is a language used in a region of China where they use the Arabic script for their local language. It's a derivative of Turkish, I believe. Uh, next is Tim Holloway. This is Adobe Arabic. This was in Typography 27 in 2005. Adobe Arabic was bundled with the Middle East versions of Adobe products. So InDesign, for example, came bundled with Adobe Arabic. Next is Titus Nemeth with Nassim in Typography 28, 2006. Uh, the blog typographer that has a review of it, for, and it's being selected as a winner, it was, in the reviewer's discussion, they commented on the, similar, the model of thinking for combining the land to the Arabic was Bastura, black letter Latin. So that was the idea of mixing these two script systems together was referring to the black letter tradition in Arabic or interpreting based on that. Next, we have Nadine, shown twice, as reference. <laughs> I know it's kind of fun. Uh, so first up, obviously, this is the Palatino Arabic, released in, uh, honored in, in Typography 29, 2007. I didn't know this. It's actually, originally it originally was based on uh, Herman Zoff's original Arabic, named Al, Aram, yes, uh, in 1956, but then it was modified for Palatino Nova, so part of that release. Uh, fascinating to find out. Now, 
this is where I made my total decisions to count, to count this towards NOSC, not NOSC hybrid, because there is strong influences of Guru in the styling of this. Uh, it's swashy terminals, you know, it's wider proportions, elongations. I thought, I, thought I, I made a judgment call that overall, compared to what we will see in hybrid NOSC, it seemed more reasonable to put in this category than the other one, but that could be debated. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> And then next we got, I mean, that's also not, I'm hearing you talk about this one, Continuo Sans Arabic. I'm like, well, it's supposed to be kitty. Maybe that could be, like, I fit another category I could think about. But this came out in Typography 32 in 2010. It's the low contrast companion to Palatino Arabic. Patrick Geisen with Kamal Mansour, uh, released Bustani, not Bustan, Bustani, uh, in Typography 37. This is in 2015. Uh, Titus Nemeth, who was actually, we just looked at it before, a couple slides ago, reviewed it in typographic of the blog, commenting, uh, quoting, but standing exemplifies Arabic type design craft in combining an appreciation of classical type forms with excellence in drawing, historical research, a technical toward of force under the hood. Because even though you can't see it at first, but is utterly no novel in the way it uses open type to render text. What's being referred to here is that prior to around this time period in open type features, uh, a secondary plugin was required in type settings. I believe it's part of the reason why Adobe products had to have Middle East editions as opposed to uh, normal traditional ones used in America, for example. Uh, so the idea that this, Arab, this open type feature substitution was robust enough to allow for a native type setting on applications uh, was supposed to, was at this time a significant innovation. Next, we have Reza Bakhtiar Farad and Omid Imani with Vaze uh, in Typography 39 in 2018. Vaze, uh, meaning clear, was designed for printing of the Quran. Uh, it was inspired by the Civic Nas style. Uh, Nezri, uh, I have an example of on the upper left, uh, Nezrizi as, an example, as the reference point. So this came from a direct typographic source. So I kind of purposely didn't talk about what makes NOS NOSC. Uh, I was waiting for this slide to talk about that. Uh, so using the again as a model to refer, uh, we see that the tooth shapes are different in their approach. We have a similarity of approach uh, in SEDA in terms of the Kufi compared to a diverse a change of decision in the initial form versus the middle and end form teeth uh, kind of curvatures. Uh, over and out, over in this way, versus either a tent shape in Uber, or as kind of like miniature tooths, like little bones of fish almost, like there's an analogy. Uh, the proportions of this, of the teeth against the baseline are different, as you can see in these examples. They generally kind of lower down, at least against Sita in this case. And this kind of baseline ribbon that Nadine talked about is a great idea. It's worth swiping for everybody, because there's basically a more bounciness. There's a kind of variance in the baseline ribbon in this case. As we saw an example with, with Bastan before, not necessarily all Kufis follow that rule, but as a general rule, Kufi is much more flat on their baseline ribbon compared to NASP. Looking at Guyana's and the comparisons, the major distinction, they're following the basic sheet proportion ideas, right? The initial form is similar to the middle and end forms in all three examples. Uh, there is a change of proportions and a kind of raising above the baseline, kind of, oh, not above, but just kind of raised up. Uh, we notice on the two initial Gaines in the Nasc, there's a slight white space raising up this letter for this character from compared to the kind of flat approach we see in Seda. Also, the, also generally the higher degree of contrast. So you know the modulation of weight we're seeing in the uh, Nasc editions versus a more consistent weight we're seeing in Seda so far. So moving on to another subcategory of NOSC of hybrid, we start with Camille Hawa with Nadan uh, in Typography 28, 2006. Uh, according to the publisher, Al Motarafa, Motaraf, <laughs> couldn't get that. Thank you, uh, Nadan. Uh, it said it's based on traditional NOS scripts, but with an appearance that's friendly, uh, that's a friendly appearance that's sturdy and reliable. This kind of simplification or kind of sturdiness is what we're kind of getting at with being hybrid. There's probably some calling from other sourcing than just NOS to generate that conclusion. Next we have Christian Sarkis with Peter Bielak. Uh, Greta 
Arabic is another example of a multi-representational design. It was appeared in uh, two separate, in a very large gap, uh, typography 33 and 37, 2011 and 15 respectively. Uh, an excerpt uh, from the promotional text for this design was, it was a 10 weight family with four widths, so this applied for the Arabic as well. So it had the, for every weight, PC from I believe, uh, light or thin to black, it went to, it had a compressed, a condensed, a normal, and an extended. So it covered the entire, the weight and style space possible uh, for this design. Christian Pierce again with uh, read a text Arabic. So there was a text edition that, according to the publisher, was the first Arabic typeface that include grades. This is according to them. I couldn't find any information that verified or denied that. This appeared in Typography 34 in 2012. Oh, man. <laughs> wow, there, there's here with Ian you know, Party and Pascal Zolby and with Azir in Typography 36, 2014. Azir uh, is Arabic for friendly, ready to assist, or in the end, according to the promotional text for the design. It's a Nas Kufi hybrid, uh, and the comic talks about a balance of palographic angular cuts and adorned construction. Camille Hawa appears again with a, actually renamed after the publishing house. What's up? I couldn't get that from there. My Q. Uh, typography 36 in 2014. Uh, according to Hawa's uh, website description, it's derived from the publisher's logo type and expanded to three weights. Next, we have Borna Aizanpina with Leleza uh, in typography 38 uh, in 2016. Uh, from Borna's website, he states this is inspired from 1960s and 70s Iranian film lettering. Reza and Almeida appear again with Ray in Typography 39 in 2018. Uh, from the project description of this, of this of Ray, it was derived first from the black weight and then the light weight was was derived from those proportions. Uh, it's as he said, there's a uh, familiar forms of NOS script, but with uh, modern new proportions. So again, this is the idea of pulling from NOS and then modifying and introducing other modes or ideas of thinking. And lastly, within this NOS hybrid subcategory, we have Mohammed Dakar uh, with, ja with Jali in Typography 40. This is the one, I think, I believe the one just came out this year, uh, in 2019. Uh, this was a University of Reading thesis project first, so I pulled a text from there. Uh, this is a signage project focused on high legibility at far distances. Uh, included in the design is a negative grade, so this applies for when you have white text on black or backlitting of text. The increase the negative grades allow for improved legibility. So just comparing, using again this model of comparison against bet in this case in the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, the major idea is that the two proportions are, are different, usually in an OSC hybrid in terms of their overall heights compared to each other. Their degree of contrast is usually reduced, as we see here, and there's generally a, a controlling of the bounciness. The bounciness is not as much, at least against these, against these examples. I have Kufi on the far left, an example of it to refer to. And that was like a layer of um, The next style is Magaribi. It's kind of a, it seems to me to be a grab baggy kind of term. Uh, we'll see from the survey on what we get from this. I did include one, one more controversial decision to put it in this category versus others. Uh, first, we have Fred Schmeiders and Laura Asla Kui with Fresco Arabic, uh, Typography 29, 2017. Uh, originally, I did have this in Kufi originally, but then I read the descriptions of it and the designers explicitly state that this is. Uh, a Kufi and Makaribi uh, influence design. So if they called it, I'm going to put it in there. <laughs> uh, and it seemed more, much more aligned to the Makaribi influences or tones as opposed to Kufi. Next, we have Titus Nemeth with Aisha. And with, and it was in Typography 31 in 2009. Uh, it was a revival of a metal type found, found uh, metal font in that of Makaribi calligraphy. Christian Sarkis appears again with Duraya. Now, this is the one I'm like, ah, it could have fit in here, could it not? I'm very on the fence about it myself. Um, the commentary is, and this is based on Diwani style calligraphy as the source. Uh, I, wasn't, I was not sure which way to put it in. I chose this mainly for 
the general roundness and kind of more uh, variance of a proportion of decisions made, but you could be, I could easily move to somewhere else and be persuaded on that. This appeared in Typography 32 in 2010. Ferran Milan Oliveris uh, with Baldufa. Uh, this appeared in Typography 34 in 2012. Uh, from the promotional text, the Arabic has rounded round top terminals and traditional contrast between and the, excuse me, the traditional contrast between curves and straight strokes or softened. This kind of reminds me of like Nadine's commentary, like childlike kind of casual feeling. That's kind of what I mean by calling Magaribi this kind of grab baggy concept. Now, this is one of my favorite ones to look at. Christian appears again uh, with, I think it's Condis, I think you pronounce it, uh, in Typography 38 in 2016. It's based on a uh, calligraphic work of Al uh, Kasim Al Kandisui. Uh, it's just incredibly over the top. It's, it's very uh, wild and inherent about how it orders, stacks, the, it combines the components together and it makes the composition such a bold design effect, especially. Uh, so I'm going to take this moment to talk about what's going on here, using the same model of comparison, using the letter bad first. Uh, the main note I'll comment on this one is the while their, their variation shows of contrast decisions, uh, the fresco Arabic has a vertical orientation of weight. The stems, the vertical toots, are the heaviest element. That uh, ribbon baseline element is the thinnest part, or one of the thinnest, thinnest part. Condens does the exact opposite. It actually has that the heaviest, it's actually a almost a horizontal weight versus a pure a high is on the vertical. Contrast that to Nask and the uh, right example on the right example, excuse me. Bless you. Um, it's more it kind of the more traditional calligraphic relationships. And you can really see in the Gaim. So in the Gaim, this variation of weight orientation really comes through. Take notice in this well in a, a middle and end form, basically how that top triangular shape uh, almost uh, turns into a, like a pizza cut slicer in the Condus example, uh, and then in the fresco Arabic, it's this kind of uh, again, the uh, change of weight energy is so different about it compared to the Nosk. Uh, the initial gain in here is it's, it doesn't have that raised part of the ribbon baseline, it's not raised up anymore, and the kind of returning stroke construction of it, and this is very different in approach. Instead of being a sheared approach, we're seeing in the Nosk, we see this kind of rounded stroke. What time I got? Ooh, oh my god, really? <laughs> uh, we have a whole category. All these are very quick because the rest of them are very short representation. I'm going to go very fast. Um, next is Nasali. This actually has two representations from Miriam Somers from Decotype. Uh, Decotype Nasalik in Jai Pagari 31, 2009. And again with Nasalik Press. There's a distinction. I could not find the copy to explain, but they seem to treat it very up. They show them differently. They have different specimens. I'm going to assume there's some major distinction about them that I could not find yet. In 2013, Amir Mahdi Moslehi uh, with Mirza appeared in Typography 39 in 2018. It was based on a calligraph uh, calligraphic source. And then with Roka, we're there, almost there again. Uh, it's a, as commented before, a very quick moving economical uh, style. Uh, we have one example from Miriam Somers with Echotype Roca. It's appearing in Typography 33 in 2011. So, if we look at return to our distribution of awards, but now to person as opposed to style, we take out there are 19 winners, 10 winners won one time, six winners won twice. We have one winner that won three times, and two winners that won four times. We'll start with Matt Moon Sakal, who won four times. These are his examples. He remembers his contributions were mostly to the Nosk and Kubi categories, uh, especially early in the annual's review. Uh, his later contribution to Bastan appeared about a decade later. Christian Sarkis uh, had another four-time winning representation with uh, most of his contributions coming into spurts 2010-12 and 2015-16. And to conclude on uh, returning back to our nominal style categories, uh, I would want to point out that Miriam Somers, who's our three-time winner, uh, has the one representation of Roca and two of the three winning Mass Elite designs uh, were from her. Uh, without her contributions, the entire nominal styles of Arabic calligraphy typography would not uh, would be absent from the record. It wouldn't be represented in TDC at all. Okay, so to conclude, because I'm over time, so I need to move. Uh, to conclude, uh, it's my wish that at the end of the survey, you understand the significance of these designers. 
who've all been selected and won in the competition. Because without their contributions, there would be no record of what is the case, what is this history of Arabic typography. And if there is no record, there is no recalling. And if there's no recalling, there's no recognition. And excellence can be answered in many ways. We can talk about quantity and duration, qual quality or function. Yet all modes answer, is this presence in front of me the case? And to say, this is the case, is the truth. It's not an opinion. To bring it all together, to recognize excellence, is to mean recalling the truth. As truth is complete excellence, and complete excellence is a kind of truth. Thank you. This served as like a good uh, preview of uh, what you know excellence in Arabic type design looks like from the last 22 years. So the rest of the time, I think we have maybe half an hour or so. Yeah, good. So um, so now we have the rest of the now we can take your questions. And normally, I've been to panels where the moderator gets to ask a lot of questions, and then the audience gets five minutes. We're going to reverse this. So we will start with your questions, and we will take one question at a time. And if I decide that maybe we need to go deeper on that point, I might follow up. Uh, but I think, yeah, let's just uh, let's just hear from you. And uh, yeah, who would like to go first? So we start with the lady at the back. Thank you. And yeah, if you could just tell us who you're addressing the question to, so that I can pass the microphone. Okay. Um, hi, great talk, um, Gwen, Nadia, um, and Thomas. Uh, so I guess this question is addressed to whoever wants to answer it. It's a pretty general question. Okay. It was uh, touched on recently, uh, it was touched on briefly, so I uh, yeah. would like you guys to elaborate. Where do you think um, software like Adobe mm -hmm. uh, can improve, make significant improvements for the Arabic uh, script? So it can advance uh, with the technologies. Okay. 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 So um, it's funny that you asked that because in a few years ago I was at A Type I in Barcelona and I was on a panel and uh, we were very unhappy with the um, Adobe software support for Open Type features in InDesign and other Adobe software and we started this Adobe Type UI hashtag and. Uh, revolution basically uh, yeah we were asking that they would fix it it became a little bit better uh, but not we're not fully there yet um, we need we, we currently have when it comes to tech technology uh, open type has an unicode before that which is the underlying system that allows us to send emails to one another in Arabic um, has developed to a point where we can do many complex things uh, and while touched upon the variable fonts and that perhaps they need to be, you know, better adapted for Arabic, you could perhaps answer to that as well. But in general, uh, technology for Arabic from a type design point of view has evolved dramatically. And with uh, Glyphs software, we are able to build fonts that are really, really quite tech uh, technically complex. So we can do that. 
On the software side, we need better UI in case we have the options where we would like to keep it to the user so that they are able to turn on and off the features. The, it's still not very intuitive, it's still a little bit hidden. Uh, if you look at all the new features that they keep putting, the investment into type features is still very minimal, so that's a little bit sad. And then the support for uh, variable fonts obviously is really slow. So at least we need to speed up. But uh, the, the answer we got when we were saying, you know, why is the UI for open type so bad in, in Adobe software? They were saying that there's not enough requests and not enough people are complaining. So I think the one thing we need to do, if we want something, we need to say it to Adobe, you know, like customer requests, tweets, whatever. And, and I think that kind of pressure is really what gets us, yeah, call them, find them somewhere. And <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, would you like to talk a little bit about the variable fonts? I, I mean, uh, tech design is a technical endeavor, but there are many folds to it, and sometimes you get type designer and not be very involved in the technicalities of mastering, producing, and releasing fonts. So I'll start to say by, uh, I'm definitely more involved in the design side of things. So that said, um, some of the problems that we faced were, first of all, the uh, adaptation of the vocalization marks with the elongation that were happening. Uh, so what happens when you design Arabic is very modular, you have anchor points that would attach the diacritic dots to them, and then you have more anchor points that would attach the vocalization marks on top of them. So one of the problems we're facing is what happens to these when the fonts start changing in shape, and the software was not being able to move these anchor points around too. So what was working in Illustrator was not working in InDesign. And some of the things that work in, in, the, in a browser were not even working across Adobe. So and that was probably maybe last year. So I don't know if they already found some fixes for these things, but that's, that's in my case, my experience. It's basically more consistency across software. That would be nice. And that's the thing we discovered as well. The teams in like InDesign don't talk to the people at Illustrator. And then, and then you have different behaviors. So. Well, just to add on that, but our idea was that knowing the history of Adobe, the big thing was it wasn't like one team designed all the applications, Photoshop and Design Illustrator. It's separate teams. Some of them were bought in, like they were just acquired. So they have all these legacy technologies that are not sharing the same data source. So that's why what works on one application might not work for another. It's a hot mess. It, it's like a problem of legacy and how to deal with it. Uh, I think even the text engine they use for shaping the letters. It varies based on the type. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's a quagmire technology, is what we're dealing with here. Uh, just want to add that note. Yeah. Perfectly on the mark as well. Thank you. So, any other questions next? So, the gentleman at the back. Uh, yeah. uh, the, we, we're, we're streaming live, so we, they need to hear you. Yeah. Um, so, for other languages other than Latin, um, like for example Chinese typography, there's a lot of, for lack of a better term, BS typefaces that are designed for um, Western audiences that are made to quote look like oh this is a Chinese typeface, this is a uh, this is a Mexican typeface, this is a whatever typeface. Are there typefaces like that, um, as far as Arabic typography goes? Where do they exist? Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on like sort of BS typography that tries to emulate um, authentic Arabic typography? Okay. <laughs> well, would anyone like to pick that? I mean, just one small thing is that's what I call Aladdin typography. Yes, there it is. Uh, that's the term I use to label them. It's just usually brushy type, and uh, it's just brushy for the sake of looking calligraphic. Um, yeah. So normally, like I have seen Latin typefaces where like B is a top, and so it's Arabized Latin. I haven't seen um, Arabic typefaces that are, Lat you know, like trying to look Latin. But we do have, for example, region a lot of logos where they copy paste uh, Latin characters, put them into Arabic logos, pretend the G is a wow, and like. Why is it more? It looks like Frankenstein, basically. So uh, I think, yeah, 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 exactly. So we have Aladdin and we have Frankenstein. So it's it's uh, lots of yeah, mythology. Anyway, so anyways, so um, I'm particularly not a fan 
of, of that kind of approach. Sometimes it works funnily well, like um, for like restaurants, and it's a very kitschy kind of thing, but it's still, it's still, and in, in, yeah, chops away, exactly, chops away typography. Yeah, so, so, so like if you go to a Chinese restaurant and the typeface is like Trajan, it feels a little bit suspicious, no? So I think, yeah, so some, there is a place for that kind, but it's very small and it's not something that is mass. So for me, I never want to design like this, but I can imagine someone will want to, and there will be one instance where, in a kitschy kind of way, it might work. So I, yeah, could be potentially, but it's not, it's not gonna revolutionize, like, you know, our type. Anyways. Yeah, next, who would like to? Oh, yes. Um, hey, so um, I actually wanted to ask because, like, this is, I don't know, riffing off the technology question, but this is more from like a product UI side. Um, there's a lot of like design movement that's like influencing like the visual culture and the way you know you design interfaces in English based on the typography, based on the layout and the design. How do you feel happening that happening with Arabic? And how do you, and especially in the sort of like mobile landscape? Um, you know, when you're operating within sort of like these fixed sandboxes. If that's too technical, I understand. No, it's 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 okay. So so I'll I'll answer and then in case you guys want to ask. So I designed the Google uh, so Notosan Arabic, uh, which we were testing on handsets for UI purposes, and I've. Am I allowed to say it? I've consulted on San Francisco Arabic? So, yeah, anyways, uh, too late. Anyway, I said it. So, <laughs> yeah, so, but I can talk about the Google one. So, in, in that context, uh, we, we were designing a NASF. I don't have it in the presentation, but we're, it was a NASF typeface, monolinear. But we also needed to have a UI version. In the UI version, we needed to resolve problems of stacking, where in Arabic you could have a, an, an alif and a hamza above and then a fatha, and then you could have the year with two dots, and then you know, and then it ends up Arabic, especially in the Nasr style, takes a lot of vertical real estate. And that will create a lot of problems in the UI interface because then you'll end up needing to have, you know, a lot of space. Another um, application where we run into the same problems is um, TV uh, typefaces in the lower third, where again the, the ticker needs to have you know, limited heights because of that. So there are issues, uh, no, there are solutions for that uh, when we design called height restriction. So the LF that has a hands at the vertical stroke is a little bit shorter, so it doesn't take as much space. We have versions of the uh, where it could be tucked up a little bit above so that we don't take, again, a lot of space. So when it comes to uh, Arabic type design that needs to survive and function in areas where you have either low resolution or you have very limited vertical real estate, um, we are either going for NASC uh, that is height restricted and usually as flat as you can get because you don't want the dynamic NASC that goes three levels up. We don't have space for that. Uh, and in any case, you're reading very quickly. You want more simpler solutions. Uh, or you would go for a Kufi design, which already Kufi by its nature is more compact vertically. Um, so that would be the influence on that kind of technology. On the other hand, um, we we still need more Arabic typefaces designed for reading on screen. So like I've designed a few, we've all you know contributed in one way or another, but we still need much more than that. And we still need more research on how we read on screen and what can help uh, in, in an interface and what else. And one of the things that I worry about is that we don't have um, enough development in, in design and UI when it comes to designing Arabic as a language. Like do you just, flip the interface. So I've consulted for Fiat on like adapting their entire interface and the Arabic and all of that. In some places you can mirror things, but in some other places you can't because if you're playing, for example, music, the forward and backwards buttons, like even if you flip the interface, the forward is still that one. And so like it's it, it, it's it's a bit hard to like get your head around that. And we still need more work and critical thinking when it comes to how do we design interfaces in Arabic natively, not just as adaptations of Latin. Yeah. So when it comes to typefaces, I think we're more or less a little bit okay on that. But when it comes to design as a discipline, because most of the times the Arabic interfaces are coming as adaptations of an English one. Uh, we're not having native Arabic graphic design as the leader so that we can design for online 
particularly for reading in Arabic, which is not the same as reading in Latin. There's a lot of things that are different. It's another lecture I could ever give at some point. But anyway, so I think on that level we need more. I don't know if you guys want to add something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you. It is a good question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, the gentleman here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. The pink shirt. Pinkish. Yes. This is... <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it comes and it goes. It's a bit moody. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 it's not that you just keep at it. It's just like you need to get it close to you. So this, um, uh, it's sort of a cultural kind of a question, and it just um, came up from what you just said, and uh, and like uh, Arabic to uh, UI designs. So, and I um, I come from another culture, like you know, like Sanskrit-based languages, and I have always felt that. Sanskrit And very easy to design like computers. Yeah. And so everything kind of came from that simplicity, and the modern work kind of worked very well with that simplicity. Whereas if you have the Sanskrit family of alphabets, those alphabets are much more difficult to design than The first books in these languages, they look horrible because they had to be like shoehorning with that simplicity. Yeah. Right? And I'm wondering if, if in the Arabic culture it's the same situation. Same situation. Um, I think you're talking about some universal concept. Uh, two things that happened: the Industrial Revolution, now the Internet. And these two things really changed a lot. The Industrial Revolution was, you know, ushered the mechanization of things. Everything needs to be produced faster, simpler, to and made more of. And so the printing press was invented with detached letters in mind. So that the same thing that you're describing applies to Arabic. The very first attempts to force Arabic into these technologies that were not designed for Arabic produced this really weird simplification attempts. Uh, some of them mature to actual style that we're now used to and that we can develop and own and push for the future. Others remain really ugly, crude uh, styles that are really hard to read. Um, that applies also to, to, to the typewriter that also force a lot of simplification to the script. Um, there's one story that comes to mind. I don't know if you've ever heard of Masri Khattar. He's a Lebanese American architect who spent the rest of uh, half of his career, the second half of his career, trying to develop simplified alphabets. And his whole uh, simplified Arabic alphabets. Basically, instead of using four different shapes for every letter at the beginning, the middle, the end, and the isolated form, he tried to unify them into one letter, and that is to make it fit into the typewriter keyboard. Um, he also did a lot of studies into, is it easier to read? Is it easier to learn? Surprisingly, he found out that people who did not know Arabic learned Arabic faster with his unified Arabic that is simpler. Um, but obviously, such a, a change was uh, met with a lot of resistance from you know, a religious and traditional uh, school of thought. So even though he teamed up with IBM and was like backed and supported and funded, uh, to kind of like make this a thing and produce videos and books and literary and literacy uh, material, it never picked up. So it's always a struggle and a push and a pull with technology. And the same thing is happening with Arabic. Um, I would just like to add a little bit from the letter identification and script complexity angle, so from you know, the legibility aspect. Um, in general, uh, Latin, like a study was done on the uh, analyzing how complex different world scripts are, and Latin is the simplest, and it really is. And then on the other maximum end, you have Chinese, 
Arabic is quite complex. The Venagri and the you know Indic scripts are along that same uh, level of complexity as well. And it turns out that the simpler shapes are always faster to read, simply because of how they register on the eye. So this is not a cultural issue. This is just simply how the eye is made. It's a technical uh, issue in the eye. You know, just the space on the retina and how much can fit on the fovea in one space. So the more complex shapes take longer to read. But there is. I think at the bottom of this, and it took me a long time to get to this understanding that yes, some scripts might be more complex than others, but I think we need to accept that complexity as part of that heritage. And if we try to, like what I was saying, shoehorn a complex script into a simpler, simpler form that is foreign to it, then we have problems. The, 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 the way that I found my way to find that simplicity is to look for the calligraphic styles in Arabic that were originally simpler in construction like in the Kufi. And this is why a lot of us, when we want to design contemporary looking Arabic typefaces, we look at the Kufi because there is innate simplicity in that style. And, and so that was our way, for, at least my way for Arabic. And, and scripts, this could be potentially a way as well, because not all calligraphic styles go towards more ornamental. Some of them are a little bit more simple in that. But even if they're, if we need to accept that different scripts will have different levels of complexity and different visual culture. It's, it's part of it. Thank you. I think we have two or three questions. So please, yes. Uh, this question is for you, Lindsay. Uh, okay. You um, hinted a little bit at the relationship between type design and politics. Yes. I didn't go a lot into it, and I'm uh, sure you probably have very long uh, <laughs> presentations about it, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about it. Um, yeah. Okay, so just like two sentences? Well, two, one minute. minute. Okay. <laughs> so basically, my, I started designing Arabic typefaces because we didn't have enough good Arabic typefaces when I was studying graphic design in the 90s. And we would design these amazing things in Latin, and when we come to speak in Arabic and design in Arabic, everything looked bad. And for me, that felt as if we anything we try to speak in Arabic would be poorly designed, and it's almost a reflection of who we are and what we deserve. And that was never okay for me, that on an ideological level, that to speak in Arabic means to look poor in, in a design you know, point of view. And so that's why I started, but then at the same time, when I was looking at the modes of communication, what Arabic typefaces could give as modes of expression to visual communication in the Middle East, when in the 90s, most of the typefaces we had were basically very badly designed, most of them on very traditional nasq that feels outdated, and it's almost the entire communication could only be poor and outdated and like badly drawn, and it's like there is no space to be contemporary, to be modern, to be informal, to be happy, to, be, to have a techno party, to have a, you know, like a, a concert, or a circus for kids, like nothing. And they, like the entire communication was not possible. And it's almost like it was limiting who we could be and what kind of aspirations we had. And that was never OK, that to say that the entire Middle East can only be poor and traditional and like badly designed, that was never OK. So the whole point of my entire experimentation with Arabic type is to allow different forms of expression that could give different and promote different ideas, whether it is progressive or educated or enlightened or any of these things that could give us hope to what the Arab world would be like. Because, I mean, and I was just having this conversation with my someone the other day, and I was saying that, yes, when we look at the Middle East today, things are crap. I mean, we, there is no escaping that. But, and if we want to design for the Middle East today, then yes, we are surrounded by all these depressing things. Uh, my, our country is collapsing at the moment in Lebanon. So, you know, what do you do? But then you design for tomorrow for um, the way you would hope your country to be, you know? And so for that, you need to allow an expression of an Arab identity that is not what we have. Uh, we're not the people who blow up buildings those are very small percentages, just very, very small of who we are. We're not all the same and we have different ideas and there is not one Arab, there is not one Arabic typeface and we need that multitude of expression and we need the ability to be something other than that, you know, uh, uh, very uh, depressed and unenlightened, uh, unprogressive, backward looking people. That cannot be us. There could be people who are like that in the Middle East, but there are people are progressive and who want to innovate, who want to work, and who want to have a decent life and live in dignity and have a good family and provide. And you know, there's so many ambitions, and we need to leave space for that expression. And if we can't, then what's the point? You know? Anyways, that was my dance. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Over here, please. Uh, just the mic, just a sec. 
Um, hi, my name is Mirna Haider. I'm also Lebanese and Lesbianese. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it works every time. Um, so I have two questions, actually. Um, one of them is, how? what do you feel about um, the seven being ha, the five being ha, uh, and the two being alif, and all those things? Um, and also the second one is that there's this desperate need for Arabic. Like, for example, for someone like me who's in, in exile here, like I, when I see Arabic, it feels like it takes me back home, and it's like my door to my like heritage and so how do you make ethical decision about who you produce those things to because for example if the army wants some beautiful topography like to kill us like you know like how do you make that decision to to contract them or not and i'm very curious about that thank you so i already had my hand do you want to I think, I think a lot of the question, a lot of the answer for that question comes from a simple idea: is agency and who is doing the design. And that answers a little bit back to your question: the idea of modernization, simplification, like changing the Arabic um, script, and the idea of who is doing these changes, who is implementing them, and who is taking the agency of making these decisions. So when it comes to the ha and that new alphabet that was championed by Said Al. I don't mind it. I think it's fun. I think it's uh, helped a lot of people communicate while, while typing. Um, I think it's part of, it became so uh, ubiquitous that becomes something that people use on social media sometimes, on the internet. So when it's easily adopted and people who speak language use it in that way, I don't mind it. I think it, it's okay to appropriate something and make it something your own and speak in your own voice. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so also with that, and, and I noticed the shift when, when we started having, like on WhatsApp, you could easily turn the keyboard to Arabic. Most of the people I know switched from that Latin with like twos and sevens and what else to actually texting in Arabic, even if it's in, in slang. So because we we don't speak the way we write, just FYI. Uh, so so then then they switched to writing in Arabic, and and I was happy that we've gone back to our own script for our own language, and that spoken Arabic can also be written, uh, because that is important if only for preserving our our part of our heritage. Because when we speak, that's also part of our heritage. Now when it comes to the question of the you know like we had a project where Glock the gun manufacturer wanted Arabic adaptations and I refused to touch the project when I was at Monotype because I will not accept that any of my funds is on a gun that will be marketed in Arabic because it's killing other Arab people basically. So I, I could not touch that. We, we also have clients where the regimes in those countries are authoritative. Unfortunately, it's the reality we have to exist in because most of the Middle East is living under authoritarian regimes. So we have to accept that. But I think for me, I draw the line on people who kill other people, like companies who are involved in killing other companies. Other. <laughs> so that is definitely out. And But luckily, most of the projects, the custom work comes from like branding for typical clients, like TV station, newspaper, that kind of these are the kind of people who are asking us for work. Uh, I have not been commissioned by the army, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think, yeah, we, we stay on that line, I guess. But yeah. So I think I part of the reason why I did start my own practice is to have more control on, on, say, no. on, on say no, who I'm working with, who I'm attracting in terms of collaborators. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it, you are a designer and you have a full-time job. You get the brief, it's already done and like broken down to you, but I was always interested like what happened before that brief was typed down, what kind of conversation happened, how did the project shape up, and this tells you a lot about who the client is, what their goal is, what they're trying to do, and you can choose what you want to do and not, and I think running your own business gives you all these kind of strings to pull on. And I think another thing is <clears throat> New York is a really exciting place to be and to reimagine who you want to be because everybody comes here with their baggage and then throw them into that city. And there is a thriving, thriving community of Arab American, Muslim Americans that are existing and doing what they need to do. And they come up with so many creative outlets. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you ever heard of something called one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one projects on Instagram. So I'm a co-founder of that project. And the whole goal is it is to come together with a group of friends and create some sort of online space where we can tell our stories, look at who's doing cool things around us, create events where we can meet up, have parties, um, so that's one way that you can reinvent your identity, speaking of 
these things that you become nostalgic to. Feirouz is for the biggest example. When you were a kid, when you were a teenager, when you were growing up, when you hate Feirouz, like, please don't play that thing ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Ask any teenager of okay. 20, you know, no. Exactly my point. And then once you leave Lebanon and you hear Feirouz on airport, you start crying. You're like, what is happening to me? Yeah, yeah. So I I tend to play a lot of favors when I'm traveling between airports, like a zone. So, but the goal, what I'm trying to say is, you can invent who you are as long as you feel you have agency on that story that you want you want to tell. Thank you. That was very well put. Thank you. So on that thought, I think we're having amazing conversations. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So before you start packing up, just stay as you are. Uh, on, in two days, we can continue this conversation because we're going to be talking about contemporary Arabic graphic design. And this is so similar to what we've been discussing today because type design is part of graphic design. This is visual communication. This is how we talk about what is part of our cultural heritage today, what is happening in the Middle East, what is happening in you know agencies who work in the West designing for the Middle East, this communication and the bridge between different cultures. These will be topics we will be talking about. We have Bahia Shahab talking about calligraphers to type designers, Arabic script and transition, and really Bahia, you really need to listen to her. We have Tala um, uh, Safi who will be talking about this documentation of the golden years of Lebanese cinema. We have Tara Atris, is also a very good friend of mine. Bahia is also a friend, but Tara more. Um, <laughs> with branding, with Arabic typography, he's also a brilliant designer. Tala as well. I mean, this is amazing work. We will be having, uh, similar to the schedule today, starting at one hour before we have type crits and panel and uh, portfolio reviews before so just check the schedule so in case you want to come and talk to us and get feedback we're uh, all the panelists will no Tara will be arriving late but we'll try to all of us be here and then on March 19 we have Mahmoud Sakal who won like tons of awards so you guys really need to hear to what he has to say talking about calligraphy type and image Dave Crossland fingers crossed we might be able to coronavirus issues, so he might not be able to come speak to us. He's healthy, but he might not be able to come uh, on variable fonts. So we continue the question of technology because we're linking technology to heritage, so related again to your questions today. And then we have Stephen Coles, who will take us on a brief typographic trip on, uh, around the world with Letterform Archive. Letterform Archive based in San Francisco with amazing collections that you can actually go and touch by hand and explore. So he's going to be showing us some of their most amazing collections. And then finally, on uh, the Saturday, March 21, there is no panel, but you can sign up and come and actually handle the books yourselves. So we have different sessions with Stephen and you can sign up. I will not be there, but you should, guys should come. So I will be in Hawaii. So anyway, so, <laughs> um, so thank you. First of all, thank you guys for being here today and for all the amazing questions and for sticking with us. Thank you for the Center for Book Arts for hosting us and, and giving this opportunity for us to connect with you know New York and, and bring this conversation about Arabic type to here. This is really a cosmopolitan city. And, and thank you finally to my fellow panelists for amazing presentations. And thank you.